And that's the beginning of the path. That's the beginning of what people call enlightenment. It isn't this saintly thing that's this high pinnacle. It's everyday awakening, seeing and knowing. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Ath, and today we are so honored to welcome back to the podcast author, occultist, magical teacher, and tarot expert, Josephine McCarthy. It is always such an honor and a pleasure to chat with Josephine and buckle up listeners because the wisdom and magical insights are everywhere in this episode. Josephine's based in the UK and has been active in magic for nearly 40 years while teaching and writing on Western mystery themes for more than 25 years. And Josephine began teaching magical groups in 1993 in the US and the UK. And she's authored dozens of books on magic that cover a menagerie of different focus areas and in-depth exploration of topics. And as I know many Glitch Bottle patrons and listeners are familiar with, Josephine is the director of Quaria, a free online magical training course that takes participants from apprentice to adept. In this episode, we are so thankful for Josephine's time as she shares about ways to bring everyday life and magic together, how the flow of fate patterns and boundaries are connected with others, different types of beings and contact consciousness and how we approach that understanding, how also our religious cultural programming can get in the way of magical development. And we also ask Josephine your excellent Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions. So thanks to each and every patron for your support and your wonderful inquiries that you shared with Josephine. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Josephine McCarthy. Josephine McCarthy, thank you so much for stopping by the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me again. You're a glutton for punishment. Punish me anytime, Josephine. Come on. That is, I usually try not to speak for the listeners, but I'm pretty sure the listeners would agree for sure. And Josephine, in discussing the listener questions before the podcast, you had this wonderful idea to kind of group the questions together and and, and topics into three broad groups. The first of which is bringing everyday life and magic together. This is such an important concept, but one I know myself and I'm sure others might overlook. What does it mean to bring everyday life and magic together? When people get into magic and and start practicing more seriously, there needs to be a transition from magical practice as being something that you do in spare time or on a set weekend or anything like that, and realizing that as you get deeper into magic, it flows through everything around you and every aspect of your life, every aspect of your body. And if you continue to walk that path with the magic separated from your everyday life, it can cause quite a lot of problems. And you also miss a great deal. Integrating the magic into your everyday life, it doesn't mean that you're practicing magic all the time, every day. It's about becoming a magical person. And what that means is, in the first instance, is to look beyond yourself A lot of people, when they're going through life, especially young adults, you gauge everything in relation to yourself, which is normal and natural and is a good survival instinct. As a magician, you you need to look a bit further than that and not always relate everything back to yourself, but to how things are happening around you and, and what they're doing in a way that doesn't affect you. You know, for instance, paying attention. One of the things I say in training a lot is, pay attention. What do I mean by that? It's a bit like when you watch people who are trained in the military, special forces, and they they learn how to go into a space and clock everything. You know, how many people are there? What's above? What's below? Is there cameras? Is there weapons? Is there this? Is there that? That's a very adrenal version of it. But that awareness when you're around a space, be it in nature, in a building, around people, that you observe and that you pay attention because magic, once you start triggering magic in your life to any great extent, 
it does flow through everything in your life and you get intersections happening with events and people that have magical significance. And if you're sort of on the paranoid scale of people, it can end up making you completely paranoid, which is not the point. It's just about expanding your awareness beyond your body and also not to personalize things, so things that happen, things that are said, things that, that you do that other people do. It's not always about you. It's not always personal. Often events, magical events flow through everyday events because it's trying to achieve something and you can be a link in that chain. And it's, it's a natural thing that's happening in, in natural magic. It's not about you. You're not the end product of that. It's just passing by you or using you as a signal boost. The first step is being aware that that's happening. The second step then is, are you willing to be that signal boost for everything and anything? If not, how do you limit that? And why do you limit that? What do you, how do you find out what's going on? That takes a lot of different magical skills to be able to un- both ask and answer those questions. So you can start to see that everyday life ceases actually to be everyday life and does become a magical life. It's very difficult to try and tease that into an everyday event because it just becomes so long and drawn out. And I don't want to spend an hour on that one, but do pay attention. And some people, they see it like augury. If there's a power event coming in or there's a natural tide that's going to be a little bit strong that's around them energetically, nature will give you signals if you learn to pay attention. And, you know, there's, there's certain birds and animals around where I live that tend to come closer when something is happening. So when I see those gathering, it's like, oh, something's going on. And then I start paying attention. Is it something in the house? Is it something I'm doing? No, no. Okay, what is it? There was a recent event like that, actually, in in our village. Both me and my husband felt a weird buildup of a very sort of unstable energy. And it had been quiet for a while, so we were a bit taken aback by this. And then we noticed that, you know, some of the birds and animals were acting like there was a destructive buildup. But we couldn't figure out what it was, and it wasn't a good time to do a reading to find out. And I didn't feel personally threatened. And that's the difference is that as a magician, if you learn to bring your everyday life and magic together, it also becomes a good early warning system. I didn't feel personally threatened, but I did feel that there was something destructive that was going to happen that was building out. And it really came to a head very strongly one night and then just suddenly stopped. And everything went back to normal. It's like, what the hell was that about? We found the following morning that a young, very, very sad, a a woman had killed herself on the outskirts of the village. And whether that was the destructive buildup and that was what was fated and that was going to happen, or someone who was unstable, the buildup filled them and it it outed through them killing themselves. It's difficult to tell, but... Through observing, first it becomes an early warning system and it also becomes a, here, look down this avenue. It's very important you shake hands with that person or you go into that shop for, for this. And Or oh, you feel a bit weird. Maybe you shouldn't go in that building right at this point in time. And the way to do that is to learn to listen, to pay attention. It's like with kids, when you take them out in a busy street and you're having to tell them, don't get too close to the road. When you're going to cross the road, look both ways. And it's difficult for them. And you have to keep reminding them. As an adult, it becomes second nature. It's the same with magic and bringing magic in your everyday life together. First, it can be a chore and you forget. Eventually, it just becomes a way of living. It becomes perfectly normal. And you learn to flow with the magic that flows through everything. The other thing that I wanted to talk very briefly about in terms of everyday life and magic is the difference between a religious approach and a magical approach in practice. When you live a magical life, you know, magic is flowing through and around you a lot. But when people, especially in the early days of getting into magic, find it very difficult to separate out a religious approach to a magical approach. And an example of that will actually come up in in the listener questions a bit later on. 
and in the West, it, because of the Abrahamic religions operate in a, in a particular way in how we think, how we act, what we do, is when you're working in magic and you're working with powers and spirits and tools and things like that, is you can inadvertently approach that in a religious way, which is about faith, belief, and also very formalized ways of approaching spirits and powers. And we draw on that from Catholicism with how rituals within Catholicism work, within the honor that's given to saints and, and how we approach the concept of Jesus and all of these sorts of things not our normal way of communicating. And we sort of put on this religious, oh, this is very important, so I have to do this in a very particular way and, and I have to be very formal about it, which actually cuts the magic and it cuts the contact. And as you go through your magical approach in practice, be aware of that religious approach creeping in, into your practice and also into your everyday life. And rather than give a lot of examples about that, I'll just drop that pebble in the pond and ask people, as you go about your everyday life, regardless of whether you're religious or not, regardless of whether you were raised religiously or not, if you're in the West, particularly America and England and France, it's a culture where its structure is built on a particular religious pattern. So it comes through the society in, in lots of ways you wouldn't expect is pay attention. Do, does it sneak out in some way? Is that an actual religious approach to how I've just done that? It makes you step back and watch your everyday life and, and how you are, because that has then bearing on how you approach magic and magical contact. So that's the sort of opener for some of the questions that, that we're going to look at. Just to your last point, if I'm understanding it right, it's that Everything is magic. Everything is patterns. Everything is this kind of field of potentiality. But when you start to make something religious, when you layer religion on top of it, it kind of puts up an artificial boundary. It kind of separates it a little bit. Would that be somewhat fair? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand what magic is and that there's no way of defining what magic actually is. To me, magic is an active way of engaging with the powers that flow all around us that we don't see, with the consciousness that flows through everything in nature. And magic is, is a vocabulary that we use to interact with that and to work with it actively and to do things. And, you know, when you formalize something, it creates a layer of separation, which can be useful in magic, especially if you're working with something very powerful. You do want a layer between you and that power that steps it down a bit. But for the most part, over-formalization can really cut down contact. And it sneaks out in little ways as well, like how you approach the magical tools and how you use them and what you use them for and the magician card in the tarot, in an ordinary tarot deck, is a really good example. They've got the table there, and they've got the four implements, the four elements, and it's all laid down, and it's all very Catholic. It's, it's the priest, and he's got his cup. He's got his words. He's got his recitation there that he can read. And, you know, he's got his cloth. He's got his bell. He's got all of these things. It's exactly the same thing. Do you actually need to do that? And if the question is, yes, I do actually need to do that because this needs to work with that and that needs to work with that all in one space at one point, that's fine. If you don't need to do that, why are they there? And that's where you start to see the religious programming through generations of culture starts to color how we approach magic. So, Josephine, given all of these incredibly important bits of wisdom and reminders, there are people out there who might be wondering, okay, I want to be a practitioner. I am, say, going through the Quaria course, or I'm engaging in this specific kind of magic, but I do, quote unquote, mundane stuff all the time. And this kind of leads to a listener question, Josephine, to your point from Anonymous, who is asking, I am a physician and a magical practitioner. What recommendations or advice would you, Josephine, give to someone seeking to incorporate the ideas and practices of Quaria with conventional Western medicine? The obvious important one to start with with that question is to keep the balance between science and logic 
and magic and to let them coexist in your mind as different layers of, of human life, different layers of human consciousness. They operate on completely different levels. One doesn't rule out the other. You don't allow the science to take a, a, a back seat with magic and you don't allow magic to take a back seat with the science. They, they can coexist. It's a bit of a juggling act and can be quite a difficult one. Because what I found is, is that, you know, physical ailments and injuries can affect the inner magical fate pattern and structure of a person. And vice versa is that magic can affect physical ailments and the physical body. So, you know, bringing those two things together can be a really interesting road to go down, especially when you're looking at what is actually causing what, what is making what worse. But as a doctor, the science obviously always comes first and the magical awareness that you have becomes the hunch button. It becomes a little voice at the back of the head that's like, yeah, but what about this? In terms of incorporating the concepts of, of quarry into practice or any magical concepts in, into a medical practice is to start with, I have to be very careful what I say here in this podcast. If I was talking directly to a physician and, and I do work with some doctors I can give that physician direct pointers if they're also a magician, direct pointers, advice, warnings, et cetera, et cetera. But a non-physician listening, if I was to give that direct advice and pointers, and there's, there's non-doctors listening, non, non-medical people who know nothing about the physical body and very little about magic, but enough to do things, can listen and try and use what I say and enact that on themselves or other people with potentially disastrous results. You know, a little tiny bit of knowledge can be a really dangerous thing, particularly when you put medicine and magic together, like in lay hands. So the advice I would give is pay very close attention. If, if they're doing quarry, pay very close attention to the various lessons. As they've done them and done the practical work, then look at them again or maybe do them again from a medical practice human body perspective, because even at the very beginning of the course, the lessons are multi-layered and most apprentices will miss out those layers. You know, as an adept, you go back, you see more layers. As a mystic, you go back, you see mystical layers you missed. As a physician, there are actually body layers in those lessons. If you pay attention, you'll start to see how some of the work can be used and adapted to work with a, a medical practice. There's also the major ethics consideration. Using magic directly on someone who's not aware of it and is not given permission for it can have a lot of swingbacks on a person. There's the medical ethics that also come into it. However, using what you learn to help with things like deeper insight into a difficult case or to use magical tools as an addition in differentials is not direct magic on the patient, but it can help you in your work on what you do. And as a contacted magician, as you build up a relationship with directions, patterns, and contacts, it does enable you to tap into some level of collective knowledge, which helps you bring power through as you're working. The majority of, there's not a lot of doctors I work with, but there are some, and the majority of them use their magical practice in differentials and looking at the wider pattern from a fate pattern perspective of what's actually happening when there's a very difficult, dangerous case. So have a look if they get a chance to look at the wider picture that's going on and then zoom it right down to look at what's going on in the body and then use that as just a part of the medical differential. And obviously the science and, and medical knowledge comes first and foremost. But the tapping into collective knowledge can be, can be actually quite interesting there's lots of different applications for magic to use in circumstances like this that are all a step removed from the patient themselves. I would never recommend, you know, a doctor work on someone magically directly unless they're a magician themselves. They know what you're doing and that you know also what you do because just like a doctor can do damage if they make a mistake in the bad way. A magician can also do damage if you make a mistake in the wrong way and you put those two together. There's a lot more 
wiggle room for making mistakes. But there's lots of sideways that, that magic can help in that you're going through training, you're going through development, you're working in ritual and vision that has absolutely nothing to do with healing. But suddenly all your lights go on in your head and something that's been bugging you that you, you couldn't figure out or you didn't understand, that light bulb goes on. So there's a lot that happens with magical work that loosens up the consciousness, loosens up the memory, but also allows you to expand your consciousness beyond yourself. There's, there's one doctor I used to work with, he's dead now, I used to work with, he was a doctor in India, and we crossed paths a few times. And he was an interesting guy. He, he was an Eastern magician, but also a medical doctor. He was actually a surgeon. What he used to do, and it was something he figured out how to do himself rather than being trained in it, but as a magician, he understood it, was to flow his consciousness into the body of a patient. And he learned not to do that very often by bad experiences and, and what it did to his body. He also learned that you flow back and forth. A lot then flows back and forth with that flow. And energetically, it's exhausting. But with very, very difficult cases, he, he learned how to flow into the body and do things and adapt things and get information and then come out. And that would inform what he was doing. And he would also, as a surgeon, make a point of if he was taking out an organ, for example, he would actually work in vision with the patient, just basically sat at the side of them with his eyes closed as though he was just, you know, they're asleep. And he'd go in vision and take out the inner organ first, which was an interesting concept. He found that when he did that, the patient recovery was actually better than when he didn't do that. But that's a, you know, a one-off personal thing that he did. So there's, there's all sorts of things that magic can flow into medical practice with, any science practice, actually. It's about your level of, of intelligence and keeping the science solid and the, the magic solid and allowing them to coexist and not drown each other out in your own consciousness because that's when things start to go bad or wrong. Really, just you keep doing, but you st again, start to pay attention, start to look, start to think start to experiment on yourself and you will start to build up your own vocabulary of magical tools and work that can complement your work as a medical practitioner. The same for scientists, for the scientists that, that do do magic is, yes, you tend to keep them separate in terms of belief and consciousness, but you can actually bring them together in a, a rational way that works not an irrational way. Uh, and that is down to the individual themselves. That's, that's not a method you can pick off the shelf and go, okay, I can do it that way. It's an awareness that develops within yourself. And you put your own checks and balances in there to not only not get silly and not get go mad, to not also damage the science by allowing non-scientific thinking to interfere in the methods that you're, you're working in. Don't kill anyone. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill anyone. So anonymous, uh, please don't kill anyone. That is wonderful, Josephine. And as you said, using effectively magic to and, and, and a magical approach to assist or augment specific, very specific medical procedures or gaining more information. But also, as you said, Josephine, also being aware of the wider pattern. And I think that that leads into a listener question we have from Michelle Rella Summers, who is asking, Hi, Josephine, thanks so much for putting yourself out there by sharing your knowledge. Can you please tell me what the F2020 was all about? And if you can see any far reaching consequences? Hi, Michelle. Yeah, narrowing it down to 2020. It started way before that from a magical perspective, and it's going to carry on for quite a while. The way I see it from a magical perspective is the pandemic is a symptom of a much bigger, wider and more drawn out destructive phase that we're going through. These tides come in and out, destructive, creative stasis. There is never any no tide. 
it's either it's creative, it's destructive, or it's like a, a fulcrum, like a stasis between the two. And if you know your history, if you read your world history, as far back as you can go, you will see these tides come in and out. And sometimes they're quite fast. Sometimes they last a very long time. This one we're going through is not finished yet, not by a long way. I think I've talked about this on Glitch Bottle before, that various magicians that I connect and work with, we were seeing this building back in 2012, 2011, 2012. We didn't know how it was going to out. And because like I've grown up, I, I was born at the beginning of the 60s. So I grew up in a golden age. It was the age of vaccines, of medicines, of contraceptives, of food, of suitable housing, of jobs, which my parents' generation didn't have in, in Northern England. It was a very difficult life until World War II. So, you know, I had the best bits, the 1960s, the 70s, the 80s, and then starting to see how that richness peaks and now it's starting to drop. It's a shock when you've always known good. It's a shock to see not good. The times I grew up in, the times I live in, immense creativity, forward thinking, innovation, all of these different things. That comes in as a tide and it leaves pebbles behind, which then flow on, evolve into, you know, the next creative tide. And then that tide withdraws and then the destruction tide comes in. And that brings disease, it brings conflict, famine, climate problems, land destruction, all of these things. And in between, you have a bit of stasis. Before we started recording this, I, I was chatting a little bit with Alex and we were talking about various things. And one of the things I pointed out to him was, you know, I was conceived, carried and born in a year where in our town we had a smallpox outbreak, for example, and when I was, God, was I the harbinger of destruction. So I was conceived and carried during smallpox in a city that also had, still had paratyphoid, it had TB, all of these things. And then once I was born, I was born in a storm, in, in quite a bad storm. And it was a brief preview, which they obviously didn't realise at the time. It was a preview to a much bigger weather pattern and storm that was coming that hit a couple of weeks, three weeks after I was born and lasted for three months. And it was the coldest, the heaviest snow for centuries. That was the 1962-63 winter, which in the north of England was vicious. And, you know, a lot of people did without food. There was no proper heating. It killed quite a lot of people. It, it was an extremely difficult time. And as our family was going through that, this is all within the first month in my birth, I got measles. One of my brothers had diphtheria. Two others had whooping cough. This is all locked into a house that snowed in with no, no things like central heating in those days. No central heating, no supplies. It's like, hey, the angel of destruction has arrived. You know, it was just like absolute chaos. But it was normal for that time. You know, the weather wasn't normal, but the rest of it was. And since that time, the 1960s, the creative phase just absolutely exploded. And so we are used to really nice creative times. And those are coming to an end for now. And what we're getting is this just destructive time that came in, started coming in 2011, 2012. And the pandemic is a symptom of that as is the populism that's spreading all over the, the world. The rise in political extremism, which has just suddenly accelerated. These are not things that have popped out of nowhere. They were all bumbling along in the background, but now they've exploded. And this division between people, hostility, uncontrolled rage, all sorts of weird stuff going on. These are all symptoms as magicians, we have to recognise that the exponential growth that our species has uh, sort of enjoyed through the intervention of medicine and vaccines, it's allowed more of us to survive, which means we need to produce more food. We, we get choosy about what we want and what we eat, what we buy, what we want to dress ourselves in, where we want to live. 
We want gardens in the desert. We want tropical fruits on our tables that don't grow on our land. All of these things cause problems around the world with encroachment into wildlife areas, with pollution, etc. This creates a weak structure that a destructive tide can fill. And also the other thing that's, that's built up during the good times is that politics is no longer about survival and evolution. It's become more about pet theories and greed and stupidity. And again, that makes it a weak point. So when the destructive tide comes in, it fills all of these weak, weak points. This is not about good and bad. It's not about punishment or any sort of Christianized ideas that pervade Western thinking. It is literally cause and effect. If you do A, then B at some point will happen. And everything that's happened in the last 12 months, from the pandemic to the crazy politics, the division between people, the crazy weather, are for the most part things that could have been avoided or could have been at least less serious if we didn't live how we do and didn't make decisions how we do. We have made choices collectively as a species. We are now like toddlers learning that, you know, if you drink the bleach, you get sick. You pull the tablecloth that's got lots of heavy things on it. All of that comes over on your head. We're toddlers. We're learning. The problem is, is whether we learn and change our behavior because of our learning or do we dig in because it suits us more economically or egotistically. And in terms of the pandemic, you know, I mean, this has been on the cards for a long time and it's been a, a situation that's just been waiting to happen, not just magically, but also physically. You talk to various virologists and they're like, they're surprised this hasn't happened before. We're getting to a phase now with encroachment on wildlife and, and nature and overcrowding and everything else, that it's just a matter of time before these viruses jump and evolve and mutate. In terms of the virus that's doing the rounds at the moment, personally, I think it's just clearing its throat. That it's not really sung yet. It's mutating and we're running to catch up with it with vaccines, which is great. But then you have populations that don't have access to vaccines. You have parts of populations that don't want to be vaccinated. There's a lot of people that are against vaccines totally. And, you know, that's their choice. We live in a free society. That is their choice. I just want to say I grew up in my very early years in a world that didn't have a lot of vaccines. And I did get to see my friends dying and people around me, my family and community dying from diseases that are now preventable. So just bear that in mind a little bit. But, you know, people have this attitude of, well, I've got the vaccine, I can go back to normal life now. And, you know, I admit I fell for that one to an extent as well. I got both my, my vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, did my 21 days on, sat on the shelf. And I knew it wouldn't be just 100% safe. No vaccine is for a start off, but, you know, with this virus and the mutations, there are certain levels. It doesn't stop you necessarily getting the virus or getting mildly ill. Hopefully it will stop you getting hospitalized or dying. And I thought, ah, oh, I can take a few risks. I can, I can nip out and do this. I can go do that because, you know, I'm, I'm getting close to 60 and you start having to be a little bit more careful with your immune system. And I got very magical, strong sit the fuck down, do not go there. And that didn't make any sense to me. It's like, yeah, but I, I got the vaccine and, and the reading I did was do not fucking go. So I sat my ass down. Now, and this is magical thinking. This is how you approach that. So the reading told me to sit my ass down and not go anywhere, even though I'm vaccinated. That doesn't mean everyone has to sit their ass down and not go anywhere. It was talking to me. Now, I didn't then spend an hour finding out exactly what the problem was. It could have been that I would go out and because I'd had the vaccine, that changes this fate pattern to over there. And that could have crossed me with the wrong person that was just carrying the wrong mutation, blah, 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 blah. So it could have been a serious individual threat to me. But I didn't look any further simply because, you know, 
I don't do a lot of readings unless it's absolutely necessary because they're energetically draining and now I'm older. I look after my energy a lot better. And sometimes in a destructive tide, you don't want to be that visible anyway. Readings make you slightly visible. If it's absolutely necessary, then you do it in your shield. But, you know, if you're doing lots of readings all the time and the destruction is building up very close to you, then, yeah, you might not want to do some readings for a little while. People have to use their common sense because I think this will carry on mutating. There are countries that, that are not vaccinated. They become petri dishes, basically, for mutations. And it is only a matter of time, whether it's in the next 10 years or the next 50 years, that this particular virus and any other viruses, especially coronaviruses, because they mutate so quickly, mutates into something that's not only fast spreading, but deadly. And also there are situations, I mean, it's not going away. The vaccines are not going to get rid of this. We have to learn to live with this virus. So we have to change how we think and how we live. And the idea that, oh, well, it only gets very old people. Well, you know, surprise, no, it actually gets younger people too. As, as we found out in, in my family with a family member, healthy, early 40s, dead within three weeks, seemed to be fine to start with. It didn't seem to be a problem until suddenly they started to go downhill and no underlying conditions. You just don't know. And this, again, takes us back to something Alex and I have chatted with, um, not on Glitch Bottle, but between ourselves, that how we live now, particularly in the Western world, and that way of living is spreading around the world. How we live today, we want a bottle of milk, we get in the car, we go down to the supermarket. You know, you want to go visit your friends in another country, you get on a plane, you go there, you go visit, you're lots of hugging, you come back. Freedom. We have freedom that we just don't even think about. When I was little, and until probably the late 60s, particularly in the town that I lived, because it was a high population from India and Pakistan, from Kenya, Tanzania, a lot of refugees. It was a city of poor infrastructure. The sewers would regularly leak into the water supply. So it, it was like a petri dish of disease was that place. You didn't hug. I never hugged my parents. I think I got one hug and that, that was two weeks before my father died. We actually hugged and I was so shocked that he hugged me. You know, you weren't shaking hands with people all the time. You weren't going here, there and everywhere all the time. You didn't travel. I mean, in the area I lived in, people didn't go out of that area unless it was, you know, going on holiday once a year to the seaside. It was a very different way of living. There was a lot less money. Poverty was, was one of the things for it, but it just wasn't in the consciousness. Whereas if you went to London or Leeds, that was different. People had a lot more money and they were a lot more mobile. But, you know, if you step back another 30, 40 years, then it becomes the same all over the country. For thousands of years, people didn't get constant close contact with strangers. They didn't shake hands. It, you know, in some religions, you do not shake hands as a matter of point. And that's because of disease control that then becomes a social norm, that then becomes a cultural thing. A lot of cultural things that you find in religions that have a dogma attached to them actually come from just common sense in the days before antibiotics, before antivirals, things like that. So I think this, it's not going to get that drastic, but I think we are going to have to learn to live in a slightly different way. We need to adapt to evolve. And these viruses come along and they help us evolve. If you look at it that way, rather than what the fuck happened in, you know, it happened in 2020 and my God, is that going to happen again? Is It's here now. And this is very difficult for younger people to get their heads around because when you're young, you want to live, you want adventures, you, you want freedom, for God's sake, you really do, is changing how you think and magically changing how you think. Because when these destructive tides come in and they trigger things like pandemics, you also get inner, for the want of a better word, pandemics, underworld beings, parasites, all those sorts of things, which can also, in inverted commas, infect you. In magic, we've been the same way. People dabble, they do this, they do that. And that's evolved magic in a huge way. You know, the experimentations of the 60s and 70s have given us so much but also exposed us to so much. 
And I think magicians are going to start really finding that they're going to have to be slightly more careful in terms of magical hygiene, just as we're going to have to be very careful in terms of physical hygiene and how we do things, how we can adapt and evolve to enjoy our lives, be creative beings that we are, while not tripping over or creating these mutants in, in these viruses. It does worry me that a lot of countries in Africa don't have enough of the vaccine and that there are some areas that will not vaccinate. That's the problem because that becomes the growth laboratory for different variants. While ever there is one country in the world that people can travel in and out of that is not fully vaccinated, you have a petri dish of uh, mutations in this virus. And if it isn't this virus, it will be the next one. We really have to rethink this idea of individualism, both as people and as nations. And this is not like socialist politics or anything like that. This is about surviving as a species in the long term, in the healthiest and happiest way we can. And, and this is an old teaching. This comes out in all the religions. You are not safe until your brother is safe. And your brother is any other human on this planet. You are not safe until your sister is safe. And that is any other human on this planet. And that's not about new age lovey-dovey thinking. It's a down to grit fucking reality. If you are as a nation, uh, and I'm not saying anyone in particular, I'm saying as a nation or an individual, if you're intentionally selfish, about how you protect yourself, then you're not protecting yourself because you've opened the door for it to come through in another way. And the same rules apply magically. So, you know, that's, that's something that's quite a lot of things for people to think about. These destructive tides, they serve a purpose. They clean off a lot of crap. They, they deal with overgrowth, which again, we've talked about before on, on Glitch Bottle and it's talked about and looked at and worked with in length in the Quarry course, and I talk about it in my books. They do a job. They're not something that you try and hold back. They come in, they do a job, they go out. And recognizing that so that you're not trying to build walls against it, but you're learning to adapt around it and then work with them. You know, you can channel a destructive tide to do things that are necessary to break something down. You can use the creative tide to create something. And as magicians, and this is, this is a call out to magicians who are also artists, creators, you know, composers, things like that. As the destructive tide really, really crashes out into the physical world, which is what it's doing. So we'll expect to see as yet, I don't know for how long, but more of the pandemic stuff more of the conflict war type stuff, more of the political extremism on, on both sides, and then the nasty person-to-person -person stuff that is really, the lid's been taken off that one. It's pretty nasty out there. As that's doing that, that's when you know the tide really breaking. The creative tide is building up behind it because it's like the sea, the tides, you know, the waves come in. There's the creative tide is building up in the inner world as magicians and artists, you can actually start to bring fragments of that creative tide to balance the destructive tide by doing contacted art, contacted poetry, contacted music of creation, creating things and not creating it with intent, with a very defined, bordered intent. But I want to bring something through that balances, that serves and that starts to light up little lights in the darkness of the destructive tide. It's like when a creative tide comes through very heavily, so you get lots of creative things, lots of innovation, like we did in the 50s and 60s. We also see a massive overgrowth in the population. That's when the destructive creative stuff started to come in and seeds little destructive dark lamps in the light, which is necessary to dampen down the creativity. You know, if you have destruction and creation, either of those out of balance destroys everything and brings chaos. So from a magical stance, widen the thinking out and look at it, pay attention. Again, 
Pay attention to everything. Pay attention to how people are with each other. Pay attention to the land around you. Is it looking unhealthy or healthy? Pay attention to nations, what they're doing. Pay attention to the greed and corruption. Pay attention to the illness and how you navigate your way through that. And then you'll find that you're wandering through a forest of energies and exteriorizations of those energies, but you're walking through a forest. You are not banging into the trees all the time. And you walk through that forest and you then come to a clearing glade. So be creative. Don't see this as the end of the world or a bad thing. See this as nature is doing what it needs to do. And the inner nature is doing what it needs to do. And your job is to navigate through that as safely as you can, as creatively and helpfully as a human being that you can. By doing all of that, you might bend, but you won't break. And you will learn a lot. You will evolve a lot. And you'll also help a lot of people in the process. So happy days. In terms of what you just mentioned too, Josephine, of channeling the tide and of course, seeing the bigger picture and using common sense Mm. for many people in 2020 and beyond in their own situations, using common sense might have been to temporarily tone down or even stop magical practice altogether. And to that point, we have a listener question from Ryan who says, Josephine, it goes without saying that this last year has had an impact on everyone, both magically and in our mundane life. Do you, Josephine, have any advice for those who are beginning to dive back into their magical studies? Always a pleasure to hear from you. Right. Yeah. Well, hi, Ryan. First thing to remember with that is that your path is individual. Uh, It's the same for any magician. Even if you're in a very tight order or lodge or group, which is very systematized and everything, regardless of all of that, you are an individual as a magician. You are an individual and always will be. And you can't really gauge what you should or shouldn't do by looking at what others are doing. But you're right, in a destructive tide like this, as the tides come and go, and and it's not like one ongoing destructive tide that's constant everywhere in the world at all times. It's like the sea. If you live on the coastline and you walk that coastline, you'll realize that, you know, the tides are slightly different in each area of each part of the coast. And the tide's coming stronger in some areas and not others, is learn to gauge what the tide is doing. And you do that through through your practice. That all goes back to module one, the, the very first module in the course. There's actually, it seems like it's just very basic stuff, but it isn't. There's a lot of skills that can be developed out of those lessons that will enable you to watch the tides come in and out and then decide as an individual How does that destructive tide affect you and affect what you're choosing to do? Like for me, with the destructive tides, when they come right in here, I find it it hammers me if I do divination. It might not affect somebody else that way, but it affects me that way. So I only use it when I absolutely need to. For some people, visionary work is very hard for them when the tide is strong. And so they don't do it when the tide is strong. For me, when the tide is strong, I can actually work a lot stronger in in vision. It really is down to the individual and to each skill. Go by your instinct and go by your common sense. If you feel like you need to withdraw for a while from practice, then that's what you do. And, you know, if you really need to get back going, you'll either feel, oh, I'm good to go now or I'm good to do this, but not that. Or you'll get nagged in your dreams. I get nagged in my dreams, you know, I'll wake up from ordinary processing dreams and there'll be a voice that will cut through going, don't you think it's time that you did X? And it's like, yeah, 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 do it. Okay, I'll do it. You know, learn to connect with a very deep part of yourself. Go with the flow. You know, go back to those very basic techniques you learned in the first module. Use them to gauge whether you should be moving forward or not or whether you should be just treading water in your practice or whether you need to go completely silent. And sometimes the completely silent needs to happen for months. Sometimes, I mean, for me, I've had it for a couple of years at a time. I've had to go completely silent magically. Other times it's a matter of two or three days, just lights out. So, you know, go back over your early skills and think about them. 
And if you're diving back into studies, don't dive back with a shopping list of all the things you have to catch up on. The big mistake. Dive back by picking up where you left off and plodding in a destructive tide. Plodding both in life and in magic is the way that you get through, not by, you know, heaving against big heavy rocks or sprinting or you know, beating yourself up to the point of blood to get through something is plod every day, plod, bit of this, bit of that, plod, what's necessary, plod. Oh, need to go quiet for two, three days, done that. Okay, I can carry on plodding again. That gets you very strong. It gets you very stable. And it also slows you down enough that you can pay attention to what's happening around you when you work, what's happening outside, what's happening with the flow, with the moon tides, with the energy tides, and with, you know, how things seem to come in crops, like, you know, mass shootings and, you know, things falling down and things blowing up tend to come in in little tight blocks, and that's where a heavy tides come in. So pay attention. But yeah, Ryan, plod away and, and go back and think over those first module skills as to how, because they're all practical skills to be used in life, not just in magic. You use them magically for your magical life. Look at how you can use them as tools to do something for what you need to do, to look at something, to observe something, to get information about something, to protect something, to clean something. It's all there. So go back and do your work. When it comes to that, Josephine, when it comes to not only paying attention, but plotting and plotting with a big picture in mind and plotting regarding the nitty gritty. We do have a listener question for you from Kevin Carlo, who is asking, as I grow, I'm drawn more towards mysticism than magic, if you will, although I still do a fair share of workings and tarot for people who ask. And so Kevin is asking, is this a natural progression or am I just taking the easy way out? How does Josephine stay so engaged in the nitty gritty with all the spiritual battles that come with it? I fully know a kind of brutal answer I am walking into, Kevin says. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Kevin. Again, it's individual. It, It can be a natural progression for you. Everyone's path through magic and mysticism is individual. And go with your instincts. You know, if, if something's not right for you, you'll feel it. You, you'll bump up against it. It's just, it. it's just not right. It's not about it being hard or easy. It's what you know in the core of your being. That is what you do. And that's what's right for you. Core is designed in a way to work with different types of magical individuals and the paths that they want to walk. So there is layers that are mystical layers that are embedded in the course that People who don't have that sort of mystical bent, they won't see those layers. You know, there's other people who who have a, a more religious bent and there's layers within the course for different religions that will trigger things. There's, there's all these different layers and they trigger with you or not, according to who you are and how you're working. A magical path can be a mystical path, just like a religious path can be a mystical path. But you don't need magic or religion to be a mystic in its absolute truth. You know, people think about mysticism as a title for someone who approaches religion in a very specific way. And no, I think it's more, mysticism is more moving away from the system and dogma and tapping into the core source itself and following that core source. You can do that if you're a plumber. If the plumber has, a, you know, the person who's a plumber or an electrician or a waitress or, or whatever, or a scientist, it's not about a religious path. If someone has that mystical bent within them and those mystical layers are embedded within them, you know, a magical course can bring that out. A religious path can bring that out. A life path can bring that out. It's not about forcing that you have to be in a magical path or a religious path. Actually, one one of the most interesting people that I consider a mystic who was not a mystic by sort of official way of putting it was Tesla, Nikola Tesla. When you read his, his autobiography, which is completely nuts, and you look at his work and you look very, very closely, you see this really highly intelligent, mystical being who's brought 
all aspects of human life together as a scientist, but also as, as a mystic without giving it any, any sort of dressing in any way. So he would dream his ideas, his work. It, it would all form themselves in his dreams, which can be his subconscious, but it could also be in the contact and it could be the mystical side of him. He was basically a vessel and a doorway. I've come across quite a lot of people like that over the years that I would consider mystics, but they're, they're not particularly religious and they're not particularly magical either. It's about you. And in terms of myself and, and, you know, how do I, these spiritual magical battles, I don't get involved in any of that sort of crap because it, it's real kindergarten stuff and it's a total waste of time and energy. I do get people throwing stuff at me on a pretty regular basis for all sorts of different reasons. Most of it is barely discernible. It's so pathetic. Some of it's more serious and formed, but there again, I just work with it, take it off, carry on what I'm doing. All they've done is wasted, you know, inordinate amounts of energy and time building up a magical pattern to try and take me out. And all I do is it takes me five minutes to take it off and carry on what I'm doing. It's like, knock yourselves out, dudes, really. To me, it's a sign of low emotional intelligence and, and not a great intellectual intelligence either. And so, yeah, I just stay away from all of that stuff. I don't engage with it. It comes at me. I just wash it off. I don't want anything to know about who it came from or anything going back to them, anything like that. I just wash it off and carry on. It's just a complete and utter fucking waste of time. I just do my work and I do my teaching and, you know, live in a very, very simple way. So I don't get into that nitty gritty of the magical and spiritual battles. In terms of inner work, I used to do a lot of inner work, magical work, uh, long-term projects. Now I focus more on, on teaching and developing teaching tools and pathways forward for people coming up behind me, because I see that as my job now. I'm right in the middle of my um, Saturn return my second Saturn return. And what I see now is because I had a period of 30 years of developing work, doing work, pressing boundaries, pushing everything. And now it's consolidating that and putting it in a way that helps other people that are coming up behind me, that are walking alongside of me. And that tends to be a lot chiller than the sort of active project work. And I used to get more involved with the, the battles when, when people would throw at me. I, I, I would approach it in a lot more of a complex, magical way. Now I don't bother. It's, I've, I've finally learned, just don't bother. Just wipe that fucker off and just move along. And it just means you have to have very, very good wipe-off methods, which I do. You just get on with it. Like everything else, you know, if you, you want to be mystical... Also, spend some time thinking about what do you think mysticism is? Whether it's not a something that you step into. Mysticism is about who you are, how you evolve, and your relationship with everything around you. That's the mysticism, not, not the dressing. So it, it doesn't matter what you do. Just think about it that way. Josephine, as well, I remember just a few moments ago, you mentioned in terms of global connections, you know, you're not safe until your sister is safe. You're not safe until your brother is safe. And that, and that I think leads really well into a question about connections and friendships and magical friendships. And so we do have a listener question from the great, the awesome Meredith Graves, who says, flex the hero returns. I would love to hear some of what Josephine has learned over the course of her magical career about magical relationships, not the guru lodge leader type, nor the romantic sort necessarily, but simply making connections and friendships with other members of the larger magical community. How should one go about this successfully and above all safely? And what are some green flags for a solid magical friendship? And most importantly, what is Josephine's best advice for how to sustain those sorts of friendships over time? Hi, Meredith. I'm waving at you. 
She's great. I, I just love her to death. Magical friendships are awesome and extremely educational. The connections with those, it, it's interesting. When you start walking a magical life, you start crossing paths with people. And it, it's funny how those connections come up. And at first, when you're going through your magical life like that, and you cross paths with someone that's very interesting and you make connections and you make long-term friendships. And, and then eventually more and more people start crossing your path. And it's interesting, you start trying to filter them out because it's just too many people. I get pretty grumpy with people at first if, if they're sort of, if I feel they're invading on my space and wanting something from me, I'll grump at them. And how they come back tells me an awful lot about them. And I've actually made a couple of very, very interesting friendships that started out with, with me or them grumping. But yeah, fate does put people in your path. You don't need to go out looking for them. You won't make vast, huge connections of lots of people. You'll make, you know, casual magical friends that are wider, but actual real solid brother, sister, magical friends, you can probably count on one or two hands over a lifetime. But yeah, you will find the weirdest intersections of how you, you cross paths with people and how they find their way to you or you find your way to them. And it's often in ways that you just would not think and often are so simple. With the internet, this has been an interesting one for me because I grew up without the internet. And, you know, the first part of my adulthood was without the internet, shock horror. There's the issue that you really don't know who or what you're engaging with. And I had problems with that for quite a while. And, and I learned some very harsh lessons by, you know, taking people on their word. I gauge people magically by looking at them in the same physical space as myself. If I can look in the face of someone I can tell you who they are. And it's that first few seconds. But when you're on the internet, you can't do that. So I've had to learn to develop a much better net radar, internet radar for meeting people. And I am learning slowly and I'm getting better at it. Probably find younger people who grew up with the internet are probably a lot better at it. But yeah, when I first meet someone, I know within seconds if that's a good person or not. And it's funny because my when I was younger and this would happen, my radar would say, hell no, go nowhere near that person. But my mind would say, oh, yeah, but they're nice and they seem OK and they're interesting. And then later, my radar would be proven right. And, and you know, my radar would say, told you so. That's the first stage is there's a very deep instinct. And there's also sometimes with magical connections with people is, you know them, you just know them. It's like with Freta Acher and I, we're really good friends. And we were corresponding back and forth for a while before we actually met. And the first time we met, he was working in London and he'd come out on the train to Exeter. And I was in Exeter train station and the London train came in and there's all these people coming off. And we didn't know what he looked like. We didn't have a photograph or anything. I recognised him straight away. I recognised his face and also all the inner beings that were trailing behind him that he at that time wasn't aware of. It. He, he came with this whole army of beings, but his face, I recognised him instantly. And it's like, I just knew him. And that's happened a few times. So it's, it's almost like you're picking up a friendship that has been there before at some other place, some other time. Just don't fall down the new age trap of, you know, oh, well, we were in a previous life and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. Often it's about a line, you can, you're, you're recognising a line of consciousness in someone. In terms of sustaining a, a good magical relationship and engaging whether it's truly good, is a way of no expectations. If a friend, like magically or otherwise, is constantly demanding your attention or whining at you that you don't visit enough, or you feel that relationship is hard work, or that you owe them something then that's not actually a true relationship. That's the product of modern expectations of, of a friendship. I've got magical friends all over the world where we might not speak or be in the same physical space for years. Um, we might not talk to each other or even by email or anything for a couple, two, three years at a time. But they know and I know that if they call out the blue or I call out the blue, there's no need to apologise there's no social responsibility dance of niceties, you know, like making excuses for why you haven't called or, 
you know, going through a list of how is your life, how is your partner, all the all these social niceties. You don't need any of that. That's all crap. They can just come out and say, I need your help. Or I just felt I needed to connect with you. Or, hey, how are you doing? And that they will be responded to immediately. I am there for them. They are there for me. And it doesn't matter if there's a long block of silence between. We just pick up where we left off. There is no expectations. There is no demands. I know that I can call or even turn up on the doorstep of someone, some of my magical friends that I might not have seen and talked to for years, and they will just act as though they saw me yesterday. And they can do the same to me. That's a true magical relationship. And, you know, sometimes you pick up on them. You might not talk to someone for a long time because we all have lives. We all have crazy busy lives and we're all wrapped up in different things. But sometimes it's like I'll have a dream and a person will plop into my dream, a magical friend that I haven't maybe contacted for a long time. So I'll call them out the blue and they'll laugh and say, how did you know? And I'll say, well, I don't. I just dreamt about you. So I'm calling you. What the fuck is going on? Oh, well, you know, I've lost my job. I've divorced. Uh, I run the cat over, blah, all these different things. A magical friend, a real friend does not count the missing years or the lack of contact. You just come together, you connect on occasion, and then you go your own way again. And there is absolutely no expectation. You're always connected energetically. So you really don't need to do the whole fake social dance thing. You're always in touch with each other at a very, very deep level. So there's no need for all the surface stuff all the time because you are actually in contact. And when something does go bad or there is a need or they need a warning, you will pick up on it because you're connected to them. And the other thing that happens between magical friends is energetic load sharing that's reciprocal, uh, that's not one-sided, that's not a parasitical situation, but that's equal. And where, you know, a friend goes in for surgery your energy will drop down. Even if you don't know they're going in for surgery, you don't know what's happening in their life, your energy will suddenly tank for a day or two and then it'll start to come back up again. And then you find they've been in surgery or they were in a car accident or or they were very, very ill. It shares back and forth as necessary. And that's always the basis of any good relationship, be it magical relationship, you know, a romantic relationship is, necessity is necessity dealt with that's that's the main thing and such friendships run very deep and they hold a lot of truth to them there are other people that want to become magical friends and and usually they want something they have agendas they have demands and they will abuse the friendship while projecting crap onto you i just don't have time for that at all and when it happens like that. And it's not just coming from a long-term friend that's suddenly having a breakdown or a meltdown and behaving weird because they're having a meltdown. When it's the person's actual ordinary behavior, I shut the door very firmly and I break all connection. People seem to think they have the right to behave in bad ways with you, to use and abuse you, to uh, use guilt, emotional manipulation, flattery, to try and keep that connection. And that behavior doesn't wash with me at all. And the reason for that is because of these energetic connections. It's, it's not just about being emotionally and psychologically manipulated and flattered and dumped on. It's what's happening energetically the same way is you being sucked dry and having your crap dumped into your energy port, which is why it's important with situations like that to cut the contact, shut the door. And I've heard people say to me, oh, you should be more understanding. You should be more patient. Oh, you should accept them as they are. Or, oh, well, that's just how they are, you know. Under such circumstances, especially when it's magical, I don't agree. That's the Disney realm fantasy of friendship. It's anything but real friendship. I slammed the door so hard, they trapped the fingers in it. Sorry, does not cut it with me. If people behave in such a way consistently and they know exactly what they're doing and they're not going to change... They'll just mask the deceit deeper and they can make it very hard for you because they'll appear to be so nice on the surface, particularly to other people, while beneath the surface is this festering snake that wants to feed off of you. People will condemn you for being harsh on them. And that comes to the point of the magician doing what they know is right, not doing what makes you popular or socially acceptable.
And that's the tough one in relationships, particularly from social pressure outside, is that you're expected to be a certain way and to appear to be a certain way, which is just bullshit. You know, practicing magic over time really pulls the veil back on all that bullshit so you can see it oozing out of people. And the worst ones are the folks that don't see that in themselves. It's always someone else. It's always projected outwards. So you really just from a matter of hygiene and protection and for your own sanity, need to shut the door on shit like that. You know, whereas a true magical relationship or friendship, there is none of this demanding and manipulating and festering stuff. People just connect. You know, they connect they talk, they swap ideas, they have a coffee, you know, they may need help, they may not need help. And then you go away again. And it's like it, the pause button goes on hold. And then when you get back together, the pause button comes off hold again. So I think it's about rewiring how you, how you think about friendships and what you think a friend should be, particularly a magical friend. One of the things with the discernment that can be an issue is that, you know, some, some magical people are tread a very fine line between being genius and slightly nuts. And sometimes the slightly nuts can come to the fore, which brings problems with it. But 90% of the time, that's not an issue. That, that is just them being them and you have to wait for them to come back into focus again. That's a different thing from someone just being passive, aggressive, slimy, psychotic piece of shit that dresses as gold and wishes to be your best friend. So yeah, discernment is, is a big one in that. And you develop that over time. And, and hell, Meredith, you've got brains fucking squishing out of your ears. You're one of the most intelligent people I know. You will figure that one out as you go along by tapping into your instincts it's funny because instincts and intelligence work together. You know, if you've got very low, I hate to say this, but, you know, if you're dumb as shit, your instincts are often crap as well. You do get some people who are dumb as shit with absolutely fucking brilliant instincts, but it tends to be more the other way. But, you know, if you're bright, there are a lot of bright people who have absolutely no instinct whatsoever. But when you get that mixture of good instinct and, and intelligence, that's a hell of a mix. And Meredith, you certainly have that. So put it to work. Make friends. It's like we've talked, Meredith. We've talked back and forth before, and we should do that more. There doesn't need to be a reason. It's just like, hey, do you have time for a coffee? Yeah, I have time for a coffee. Right, well, let's have a coffee. Hey, let's rip the, the world apart magically while we're doing that. Let's, let's have a look at everything. So you just do it. And then if you don't speak them for another two years, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if you called me in the middle of the night and said, I don't know who else to turn to because this is happening and I need specific help, I am right there for you. That's how it works is there's no niceties at all. I think I rambled there, but I hope I made sense to you. <laughs> Josephine, that was absolutely wonderful. I, I certainly second your motion on, on Meredith. And I think discernment, that is such, such amazing advice and, and such a wonderful reminder. And that really does touch on this theme of relationships and connections. And some of those relationships, Josephine, as you've shared on the podcast before, have to do with your family and your children. And we do have a question for you from Natalie K kind of going along with this theme of relationships and connections. And Natalie is asking Josephine, any advice for tired mothers who have wonderful curly headed lunatic children that they love so much, but also find it challenging to integrate magic into parenthood and parenthood into magic. How can one protect their personal practice while also protecting their children's personal experience of figuring things out, quote unquote, asking for a friend, Natalie says. <laughs> Hi, Natalie. Yeah, the first advice for tired mothers with lunatic children is get a lot of duct tape and duct tape them to the wall. Um, yeah, <laughs> probably not the best person to give parenting advice. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I mean, Bradford, where I grew up, this sort of uh, child rearing methods were pretty Spartan. I think Spartan would be the way to describe it, you know, expose them to the elements. The ones that live are the ones that you raise. Yeah, it is a difficult one. 
and there was a fashion in sort of the 70s and 80s that if you did magic, that you involved your kids in everything you did. If you were pagan, you know, the kids were dressed up as little pagans and went to everything and blah. And, you know, it's the same as, you know, the kids going to church and stuff. That doesn't necessarily breed magical minds or, or thinking minds. And with your own magical practice, having kids around, it is really tough, I know, because I've been there and done it. And you have my deepest sympathies. You can give them a, a magical upbringing without necessarily involving them in magic, unless as older teens, they turn around and specifically ask to be involved. Magic is a path that must be awakened for the individual themselves. It's not a community path. It's an individual path. At the end of the day, it really is about the individual. Finding ways to be on your own magical path while raising kids, it really is different for each family situation. And, and for me, with my kids, they never saw me do anything actively magic, magical like rituals or, or doing anything specifically magical. Unless, you know, in later teens, they occasionally saw me working with a group of magicians. But in their childhood, no. They knew it was happening and they saw my implements. They saw the working rooms. They knew the other magicians. They were mixing with them. But they never actually saw or got involved with anything magical. And I think that's quite important. Whenever I worked alone in vision and ritual, the door would always be closed or they were out or they were in bed. There was nothing active that, that was done around them. And it doesn't need to be integrated. What I did bringing them up was I was a magical parent rather than a parent that did magic when it came to my kids. So I talked to everything. I talked to the garden, I talked to the birds, I talked to statues, I talked to pictures. All very shamanic, very normal. I never announced I was going to do anything special. I would just do what I did as quietly and out of the way as possible. But, you know... I would hold conversations with, like, we had a Ganesh statue that lived in our kitchen and came alive when we moved to America. And he, he, was, he was very verbal and very demanding with his food. And I would hold conversations with him verbally. And, and you know, the kids were there and they would laugh. And it normalized things. And it was like, oh, Leander, can you, can you just pass Ganesh some chocolate, please? Just shut him up. Oh, okay. Hands him the chocolate, carries on with what she's doing. That was about the level of it. But what I would do was in terms of bringing them up as spiritual beings, I would drag them around temples and cathedrals. I took them to Gurdwaras, to you know ancient pagan temples. I took them to churches, everywhere. And I would tell them stories about the places that they were in and tell them about the beliefs and the religions there. I would tell them about the philosophy and the history of that religious thought, that magical thought, that pagan thought. So they got a wide, shallow, but wide view as kids as to this world that is around them. To them, I was just eccentric, you know. And later as teenagers, when one got interested, you know, I let her attend a teaching session that I was doing and so she could learn some basic skills. She was a good visionary, a very good visionary. But I waited until they got into the back end of their teens for that. And I never taught them things as a magical dogmas like, you know, this particular path or that particular path. I just taught them specific skills and then let them get on with it. There was no baggage with it, no belief with it, no formal teaching. And so it was a bit like Apprentice Module 1. It was that sort of thing that's in the quarry course. When they started searching for their own path and, and you know, as, as later teens and also as younger teens, I backed them up all the way. You know, one wanting to go to church and Bible class, not a problem at all. I will take you there. I'll pick you up. I will buy you the Bible. I will get you anything you need. You want to be atheist and rational? No problem. You know, your mum is weird, but let's ignore that and we'll talk science. It's about what comes out of them, where their interests are. Follow their interests, not yours. Don't hide your interests, but don't activate your interest in, in front of them. I brought them up knowing about all the different religions. They joined in festivals of all the different religions. They went to vigils. They did, you know, basic fasts. They did Ramadan, Eid, Diwali, you know, Christmas, Easter, all of them. Also, it was a multicultural society that they were growing up in as young children and with various members of the family who were from different cultures and different religions. 
So they were exposed quite early on to a lot of different religions, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different skin colors, and a lot of different ways of behaving. So they learn to adapt to people as they grow up and not see things as weird or bad or odd, just different. And they then had a big choice of where their mind wants to go, where their spirit wants to go. I never had magical books in the house. I, I still don't, actually. I got very few magical books. What I had and have is bookcases full of history, religions, art, philosophy, uh, humour, all sorts of different things that, that could follow their interest, geography. You know, I had encyclopedias of different parts of the world, encyclopedias of the different phases of development in humanity that they could dip into that had lots of pictures, but intelligent text that went with it. It didn't talk down to them. I think that's a problem that a lot of young parents make is talking down to their kids in terms of books. I was very lucky in that my father would just dump a book in my path and go, you might be interested in that. And it was way above my reading pay grade, but I would struggle with it and it would fascinate me. And it actually taught me to read much better and open my mind out a lot more. But then he found that I would engage with heavy text if there was a lot of pictures. I'm a picture girl, I'm a visionary girl. So he got in quite a few books with beautiful artwork, lots of pictures and lots of intelligent text. And he would just sort of leave it hanging there. So I did the same with my kids and just broadened out the subject matter. So medicine, herbs, geology, geography, the whole thing. And then wacky books as to, you know, how to survive when the world ends, how to make your own toilet, how to, how to make a battery, how to make this, how to make that. So there was lots of sort of experiment things for them to look at as well, which then helps their science side grow. It's a bit of a minefield. And I think at the end of the day, you can't go wrong if you raise them with ethics and with a sense of awe in creation and a sense of respect for science and the planet and pictures and talking and activities and going places that are to do with different beliefs and different religions and having magical things hanging around, but don't have the magic done in their space. Because also from a magical perspective, especially, you know, even when they get older, past the very early phase, is if you get a sensitive child, they can tap into what you're doing energetically. And the closer they are, if they're actively in that room with you, you are tying them into that magical work. So that's a really bad idea. Is, you know, if you don't have a, a space that you can close the door, which in some of my places I lived, I didn't. I waited till they went to school. I waited till they were playing out. I would get up at three or four o'clock in the morning to do stuff while everyone was asleep. You'll find a way. Just follow your instinct. And just the fact you're asking that question means you're an intelligent mother who, who really cares about the development of her children. So you will find your own way. You will, you will do fine. You know, and if you blow them up, well, you can always have more. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> 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 I just, I'm sorry I can't resist it this is, this is the Spartan parenting It's like, ah, it'll be alright <laughs> Yeah, of course they want to ride a, a horse bareback And they can't ride, but it's a stallion And there's this like, you know, open field That goes into like a site that's, that's danger Because it's got mines, you know It's got exploding mines in it Yeah, they'll be fine that, that's, Yorkshire, <laughs> that's Yorkshire parenting Yeah, they'll be alright I've broken so many bones in my body and got scars and that's childhood. You know, it, it's just, that's how it was in those days. You didn't have seat belts, you know, you would go out the door at like when it wants school, seven o'clock in the morning, out the door, you'd fill your pockets with food. You'd come in again at about six o'clock at night. They would have absolutely no idea where you were, what you're doing, where you'd gone. And we would roam for miles you know, I was thinking about it actually the other day that when I was a kid, I used to walk to a town that was about seven miles away and hang out wow. and, and just wander all over the place and get up to the craziest shit. And, you know, potholing before I knew about safety and gear. Yeah, 
I'll have a try at that. Fall down it, yep, I'll do that. You know, fall out of a tree, land on your head, yep, I'll do that. It's just, you know, and then trying to do little magical rituals in the garden with your mates, yep, I'll do that. You just let them go for it, basically. If they live, if they reach 18, you've done a good job and they're good to go. (laughs) That's perfect. Well, and that seems to be tying into this theme about something we discussed, Josephine, in previous podcasts, which is so many people obsess about, for instance, with magic armchairing things to death, where they say, well, I'm not going to do it until I figure everything out. And what you're saying, and, and to Natalie's question is, when you jump in, when you just start doing it and get the kinetics down, all of a sudden, some of the answers start appearing. They start materializing. Yeah, yeah. Raising kids and raising magical kids is exactly the same. It's, it's just there's a different element thrown in. They have to fall. They have to trip up. They have to burn. They have to break something. They have to go through all these different experiences because that's how you learn to survive. And as a magician, as a parent, it's the same thing. You have to take risks. You have to weigh up, you know, this against that and and just try, you know, suck it and see. You, you try things and see what works and what doesn't. And if it doesn't work in a really bad way, you'll know definitely never to do that one again. I see it in kids today is that they're so overprotected that they just don't develop. They don't develop safety mechanisms. They don't know how to survive. They don't even know how to feed themselves. Um, in some, some families, it's like in the village here, there are some families where I want to say to the mother of a 15-year-old kid, is like, for fuck's sake, stop feeding him. Just let him feed himself. Let him cook something. He's watched you enough times. If he's hungry and there's no snacks, he will learn how to cook. Because what the fuck is he going to do when he goes to college? How is he going to look after himself? Is he going to live off burgers for the rest of his life? And, and he won't take risks. It's because he'd been so coddled as a child that, oh, no, you can't climb a tree, you might hurt yourself. Oh, oh no, no, you can't cross the road. Don't go any further. I was crossing a dual carriageway when I was six years old because I'd been taught how to. And I'd been taught to stand there, even if it took half an hour to wait until it was safe. That taught me to pay attention from a very, very early age. So you're teaching them life hacks. And obviously my parents would be watching, but I used to think they couldn't see. And a lot of these sorts of things is these life hacks become magical hacks and the magical hacks become life hacks. There needs to be, like with magical training, there's a lot of stuff I've put in Quarrier where I'm saying, right, go do this. And so everyone thinks, oh, yeah, this is what you're supposed to do and it's safe. And it's like, actually, no, you're not supposed to do that and it's not safe. That's why I've told you to go do it because you will find out why you don't do that. It's not enough to actually harm someone badly, but it will be enough for them to step back and go, what the fuck is that about? That's when someone is starting to learn and not armchair. Because you can armchair while still doing practical work. If you're just mumbling along and not thinking about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what is it teaching you? Where is that teaching going? All of these different things can be applied in magical training, in raising children. It's the same thing. You can get sued more in one than the other, and you can go to prison more for one than the other. But it's basically the same thing. There needs to be a certain amount of discover through good experience and bad experience. Parenting is very much about learning from bad experience as well as good experience. The only serious thing I would say is just, you know, like I said, don't have the child in the room while you're doing the magic. That's the no-no. Everything else, you'll figure it out. To that point, Josephine, uh, with this theme of relationships, we do have a question from Anonymous who says, Hi, Josephine. I'm currently in a multi-year relationship with a manipulative, emotionally damaging person. This person went from supportive to slowly becoming more and more damaging and manipulative. I will be leaving as soon as I meet my financial goals and locate my next move. My question for you, Josephine, is in the short term, as I finalize my leaving, what magical rituals, visionary work, or other recommendations do you have to protect my mind and lessen the negative effects of this person? Thanks so much. Well, you know, the obvious thing is the mental and physical health 
of being in such a stressful situation. I know because I've been in that sort of a situation. What you have to do is weigh the long-term damage versus the waiting to get the optimal chance to get out. You can wait for the perfect time, which can take a long time. What you have to think about is how much damage are you willing to take to yourself before you leave? That is not an easy one because I've, I've gone through this more than once. The first time I just bolted, which saved me energetically and psychologically. But, you know, bolting with a couple of small kids with no financial planning is really not such a good idea. I get where you're coming from. You, you do need to financially so get yourself solid. I think one of the things to think about is not go for the ultimate, as in meet the financial goals to, that's perfect. Once you get enough to do what you need to do, even if it's really tough and in the shittiest conditions, get out. In terms of magic, most people would recommend you to, you know, protect yourself and blah, de, blah, de, blah. Actually, that's the secondary. In such a situation, put the focus on the road ahead. The, your fate path ahead is a priority. Not the planning of exactly where you're going to live, how you're going to live, blah, de, blah, but the fact that you are going to leave and that that is a strong forward thinking thing. That starts to form a fate path for you. And, and it sounds like you're beginning to do that already is just don't waver with that. Once you've made a decision, the fate path starts to form and there's certain magical things you need to think about. You can do practical stuff like, which is again, Quarrier module one, all the, all the basic sensible stuff that you need. Ritual baths, full moon and new moon, putting on a protective talisman. You can make one, a simple one that's, that's a directional one. So I think it's less than seven. What you're doing with that sort of talisman, rather than pinning specific magic into the necklace or the object, is you're asking for whatever is necessary to move you forward on your fate path out of this situation. That allows inner energies and fate patterns to start forming and doing it intentionally and then wearing that. It doesn't need to be flashy. It's something plain, like a band, a plain ring band, a plain chain, anything. That adds another layer. It's all these different layers. There's no one thing. You need layers of stuff. If it's not gotten violent and it can go down there, this is some of the things you need to think about magically. When you live in a relationship with someone or you're very close with someone, and particularly if you're magical or energetically sensitive, energetic connections can form themselves. Well, they do form themselves between you and that person. And it embeds and it, it can get very complicated. If they are also sensitive this means they can pick up on your actions and intentions through those connections. They might not understand what they're picking up on, but they'll feel something's wrong and they'll start getting paranoid. One of the ways to deal with that is not over plan. You said you wanted to get the location and finance sorted out. Location in the short term is not so big a deal. The finance is. You have a basic figure that will be enough to get you out, get you safe and get you deposits for where you need to set up. No more than that. Have a necessity line, not a, this would be optimum. Think necessity. You know, you've got that necessity amount in your mind and that's it. Don't keep planning and thinking because they will pick up on it. And I've had that happen to me with a non-magical partner and they picked up on it. And I could not figure out how the fuck they were doing it. It's because they were energetically sensitive and I am. And one way you can block that, if you think that they've just suddenly picked up on something and they're digging, is singing a silly song in your head, like an earworm. Looping an earworm that's like a nursery rhyme or something like that. And if you're, for instance, booking a ticket as part of the get out, while you're booking the ticket online, have the nursery rhyme going in your head. It's like a wall that magic finds it very hard to break through. It's, it can be quite actually quite difficult to do because it, it actually needs a lot of focus. It's, it's like a magical technique in itself. But if you've got a song that will go on a loop in your head, keep that looping because it drowns out everything else so you can go under the radar with it. So just be aware that they can pick up on stuff. The more 
in detail you plan, the more chance they can pick up on it. And then when it comes to the point of leaving, don't plan a single day. If it means that, you know, you're going to have to book a flight or anything, then have enough that you can book a flight within 24 hours and maybe stay at a motel overnight. You know, I've had to get out of a very dangerous situation and I had to think about these things is don't have a fixed date because, again, that can be picked up on and things can start forming around that, that they can pick up on it. If you plan, okay, when I get to this amount of money, I'm going to go. When you get to that amount of money, just get on with your everyday life, doing what you're doing. And then one day, instead of driving home from work, you drive to the airport and you've already got a bag packed or somewhere that you can just, you know, maybe go home, pick it up. Oh, I'm just going out to the shop. Boof, that's it. You're done. If it's a violent or dangerous manipulative situation, that's the way to do it. This keeps your scales balanced. But, you know, one of the things to also think about in this is just balance, justice and necessity. Don't get into revenge. Don't get into lashing out or punishing them for what you think they deserve or hurting them in a way that is absolutely not necessary. Your job is to get out safely and deal with your own shit and let fate deal with theirs. Keep your own scales balanced. And that stops these long drawn out fate patterns forming where the injustice swings backwards and forwards. And that can go on for decades. That person's bad deeds are their own. Your job is to be safe and to be in the life that you feel you need to be leading you're going towards that. You're not pushing them away from you. You are moving towards your future and you are putting up a wall that they can't follow. So that is a way to also think about it. And good luck with that one. That is a very difficult one. It's non-magical advice, but the other advice I would give you is once that break is done and then there's the aftermath of, you know, if there's lawyers involved, if there's phone calls involved, is you will, as a magician, spot straight away if that relationship was parasited and if the whole situation is parasited because you'll be driven to get the last word in, to call back and say, and another thing, and to be constantly back and forth with each other in a very adrenal way. That's the parasite involvement. You be very fair, honest, with integrity, with justice and nothing more. And that will break any of that. And it will also protect you against your own stupidity, which we all have, especially in situations like that, that brings our worst part up to the surface. It will also protect you against the longer term fate patterns coming from that other person. You know, don't treat like with like, treat with necessity. And really best of good luck with that one. Josephine, thank you. I I can just say, you know, having spoken with this person, I, I know that they will really appreciate it. I know I really appreciate that. Just incredibly powerful and and deep reminders uh, just about setting up those those boundaries, being aware, focusing on the long term and kind of the, the fate pattern first and foremost. Uh, and Josephine, to follow that, you know, in terms of boundaries, that brings up an entire kind of main category that I know that you wanted to touch on. And we have some listener questions for that, which is about our energetic boundaries themselves and about the boundaries of our consciousness and the flow of fate patterns. Can you share with us for those who might not be too familiar, Josephine, what does it mean having a conscious body or how do fate patterns flow? What would you like the listeners to know? (laughs) (laughs) just a very Um, small just a very small question you know yeah just a little question good lord well the thing is is that this is really complicated stuff for a start off and one one of the listener questions from shaman was a very interesting one about you know book spirits bodies consciousness different selves different parts of different selves And we can all have theories on this and people have theorized for thousands of years on on this and everyone comes up with their own sort of version of it. And when I was young and I used to read some of the theories on, on soul and spirit and this, none of it quite hit true for me. 
it wasn't quite right. It's like something was missing a point. And what I learned to do was then just look at myself and observe. That's always the best way to learn is you learn from yourself and then, then you look at other people and see, does that replicate in other people or, is, or are they different? The way that I approach this sort of thing for me is that there's a spirit me and there's a body me and there's a bridge in between them. The conscious me, which is the consciousness, the sense of identity of who I am, is very much about my body. That comes from my brain, my endocrine system, my biology. It's a part and parcel of my physical existence in this life. It's part of my survival mechanism. You know, the whole thing is how, how I am as a conscious being is to keep my body alive. And when I die, I feel that that part of me, that identity of me will fade off over time. Um, the bridge part of me between the bridge of the conscious me and the spirit me, I consider to be the subconscious mind. It's something that has a foot in both camps, so to speak, and that the subconscious mind can sort of bridge the conscious mind, the conscious me and the spirit me together. And it acts as a translator between the two and, and, and speaks through dreams through visionary work, through, you know, creativity, through those sorts of things. And the spirit side of me, I, I see as residing in or through my body, but not dependent on it. That it's not of the body. It's not something I can have a conversation with, but I'm aware it's there. It's not gendered. It's not Josephine. It's me. Josephine is this physical, biological being that will die at some point. But the me I am also aware of that there is another me that's there before and after. I've learned to tap into it briefly, and it acts like a lantern for me sometimes as a pointer for me, but it's not wrapped up in everyday life and emotions. It's more like this is following, the spirit is following a fate path, and it connects with me as a conscious person when I'm veering badly off a fate path that I, I really need to be on. And I think this, this sort of thing really brings up a lot of questions about who we actually are. You know, this thinking part of me, who, who is, what is that? We think, oh, that's, that's the brain that's thinking. Biologically, we're actually made up of all sorts of shit, you know, fungus, bacteria, viruses. There, there is no I. There's a we biologically. And like magically, the organs are a part of us, but magically you can communicate with them as though they were independent beings. What I do is I basically throw science and rationalism out the window for a while. And I see the organs of the body as a collective that makes up a vehicle that's my body. The organs, for example, are like vessels for parts of my consciousness that operate through the organs that sort of makes sense. So I avoid getting into or theorizing around cultural, mystical or religious dogmas in this, but just observe and draw conclusions. What I found with my body and with the organs is watching how they respond to magic, to life and how they influence my magic. So for instance, you know, I'll talk to an organ if it's suffering. You know, if the organ's showing some struggle, I'll talk to it. What I do is I actually go in vision into my body and the liver presents itself looking in a certain way and it has a little being or person that I see in it, which is my mental projection of vocabulary for its voice. And I'll say to it, well, what's, you know, what's going on? What, what's happening here? And, oh, you need to wake up. You're not doing your job. Look, you need to be emptying. You need to be pressing that button or, or emptying that well out and you're not, you're not doing it. Come on, you need to get to do that. And the, the being is like, oh, shit, I was asleep. Sorry. Or it's like, oh, God, I don't know, but there's all this stuff coming in and it's making me feel really ill. You're talking to your organ and the organ is finding a way through your consciousness to communicate to you of what is going wrong with it. And it's all part of you, and this is all part of your own consciousness, but you're separating it out so that you can talk to it. And biologically, the same thing basically happens is, you know, when, when an organ is in 
having a problem, it starts putting out chemical signals. It talks and it tells other parts of the body that it's having a problem. And other parts of the body start to react to that in order to create symptoms, which would then stop you doing something or make you do something. So it actually gets really, really interesting. It really does bring into question as to what is consciousness. You look, if you think your whole body thinks, and when you subdivide the body into organs, they all have their own ways of thinking from a magical perspective. And the more that you can you know, move your signs to one side and say, right, well, I need to hold a conversation with my liver. To do that, I need to be able to separate that liver out from me so that I'm talking to something. Basically, what the Greek philosophers did, the way that they would get across a philosophical point was to put it as a conversation. Well, it's more or less doing the same thing. You create a conversation with different parts of yourself so that that part of you can communicate back. And with that, like with the, the deeper part of myself that I feel is beyond the physical body. One of the ways I can communicate with that is through art. It is non nonverbal and not figurative art, just going for it and seeing what comes out and then working with it and studying with it. When I was a youngster, I volunteered to be a, a guinea pig with a group of guinea pigs in a hypnosis thing. And it was a GP, it was a doctor that was actually doing it. And he was looking at, I think it started it for looking at using hypnotherapy for postnatal depression and also for premenstrual stress, that, that sort of thing. He was a Hindu and he was very much a believer in reincarnation. And so when we got talking and we, we did the first session, he said, actually, I'd like to try and regress you. And because he was a GP and I had somebody there with me as a chaperone, it's like, Okay, you know, I'm good for that. I'd never been hypnotized before, and I basically thought it'd be a lot of crap. But what was interesting that came out, and it was interesting because I could, you know, in retrospect, see and feel and remember what was part of my subconscious that was talking in the hypnosis, and then what was part of this very distant self that also managed to talk briefly through that hypnosis. The way we got to that was he realized I was very easy to hypnotize and that I was very visionary. So he, he pushed it in a way that he hadn't pushed with other people before. And he took me to the point after my death. So he took me through time and he did it in both directions, you know, before I was born and then after my death. And the feeling I, to this day, I still remember that feeling. It's the major thing that stuck out was this absolute stillness and silence, but consciousness within the stillness and the silence. No body, no time, no movement, nothing, but being fully conscious of that. And it was normal, it was fine, and it was beautiful. And he, he was asking me questions like, you know, what advice would you give to yourself if you could through life? And I just said, don't bother. I was very young when, when we did this. And since then, I've had a couple of times where, you know, deep in the contacts, when I've been in absolute distress, and I've just said, you bother too much. <laughs> and it's the same story. You bother too much. It's this sense of the, just the stillness. It's fine. You are doing your fate path. You are trucking along. The rest of it is completely fucking irrelevant. And that, I found, was, was so far out of my consciousness for that age and time of myself. And also my subconsciousness, that was just not in my radar anywhere. And it was so deep and so powerful. When I've been in absolute back to the wall, you are about to die sort of situations, which I've, I've been in a few times since then, is that part of me comes to the surface like it's okay. And that's, that's the most conversation you can get is it's okay just you're okay and so to me that's my eternal self that could be a subconscious level who knows but for me that's how I've experienced it and that's how I perceive it is that's the part of me that doesn't have identity doesn't have gender is working is flowing and eternal through a much bigger 
fate pattern that this life is just a part of and that the me that is Josephine and the subconscious me, which is, is the very fucked up dreams, Josephine, is my biology. It's my body. It's, this is the vehicle that puts my spirit on a fate path for as long as it needs to be. You just need more acid, then you get it. I think that's the, <laughs> that's the way to look at it. It's like, I'm not a drugs person. My, my brain and body just cannot handle substances. But, you know, it's just it, it gets to that phase of like, oh, for God's sake, just get drunk or drop acid and you'll figure it out. Well, and uh, as you said, Josephine, Charmaine asks, while discussing visionary technique at the beginning of module three, lesson one, Josephine states, quote, dreams are best left to unfold themselves naturally. So the magician uses controlled and disciplined vision and uncontrolled, uninterfered with dreams that allows both sides of the human mind to express themselves in their different ways. And Charmaine asks about something you touched on about the different kinds of consciousness and different parts of our body. But Charmaine kind of ends the question with this. How might Josephine remaining ignorant of those connections of those different parts, having a consciousness, how might remaining ignorant of them or connecting with them possibly affect one's magical work? Well, that's the one way you suck it and see, basically. It is what it is. I mean, I, I don't know, to be honest. I know what it's done for me as a magician, learning to recognize the different levels of consciousness in my body and in my organs, in the world around me. You know, my consciousness does not stop at my skin. It, it seeps out. It connects and flows into my cats. We share consciousness with my husband. We flow back and forth all the time with a shared consciousness. It really brings into question what consciousness actually is, because I don't think we actually understand what it is. And there's no way of measuring that other than from your own direct experience. And of course, it affects your magical work in that it changes how you perceive the world around you and it changes how you perceive yourself and thus changes how you perceive magic. It's one of the great adventures of being alive, is watching this unfold by, by observing and, and questioning and talking to everything. You know, your kidney's having a bad time. If you've, you've gone out and drunk loads of stuff, talk to your kidneys. You know, you talk to the walls, you talk to the trees, you talk to literally everything. Because if it has a consciousness, then you can pick up on that conversation. And it's when it converses back in a way that you didn't expect at all and weren't aware of, then you're like, ah, this is interesting. Then you start to stretch in that direction and experiment. Magic is just one huge adventure, just as consciousness is. And when you put the two together, it gets really good fun. So, Josephine, we also have a listener question for you from Etch. And Etch is asking... Josephine, is there such a thing as the magical state of mind? I'm a novice, so I may be using the incorrect terms for certain concepts. My magical experience ranges from following a written ritual to visualizations similar to Van Gogh's Starry Night and to meditations, including your Josephine candle lighting ritual and entering the void, which I've read about in your Magic of the Northgate, one of my favorite books. But on the other hand, Etch says, I've been in a meditative state where I knew without question that I was in what I would call a magical realm. So Etch is asking, is there a common quality shared, Josephine, by these experiences and others for that matter? Or are the differences what define the magical state of mind? Everyone who does magical work or mystical meditation or religious meditation can experience what this person is calling the magical state of mind, and they, they experience it in different ways. There's no set common quality that you can pin down as a reference point. And etch, you've already stumbled on that yourself. You knew without question, you clicked into a magical state where you were bouncing on the edge of a magical experience. Don't try and measure your experiences against others to fit a norm or an ideal. Just do your thing. Learn from your own experiences. Keep a journal so that you can track the development of it and then get on with it. Keeping a journal when you have these sorts of experiences is, is quite important. I keep saying this to my students over and over again. You know, there's an official journal that they have to keep, which, which is tasks that they're set, but also have your own journal 
where you notice things and you date them and time them and keep track of them. As you go back and look back at two years, three years before, you can start to see how things are opening out and developing. When you go into magical training, regardless of what style of magic that is, if that style of magic works with visionary work as well as ritual, what happens is the visionary work starts to give you boundaries and vocabulary and understanding, and then also teaches you slowly how to differentiate between your own conscious and subconscious and a magical experience. And that comes from time experience and paying attention. And what you will find is if you're training within a magical system that uses visionary experience, is that you'll look back then on these states and realms that you found in your own meditation, and you'll understand what it was you were experiencing. It's one thing to give information for me to say, oh, yes, there's A, B, C, and D. That that would be core signs that you're entering a realm or a, or a state of mind. And that information is just that. It's just information, and it is of no use to you whatsoever. And this is something that I really try to get across to the magical community, is there's a big emphasis on the collection of information which they perceive as knowledge, and it's not. It is just pure, cold information. It's not rooted in experience. When you get things like magic where people are just passing information along the line without direct experience and and long-term direct experience reflecting into that, that's how dogmas develop. And you get dogmas in religion. You also get it in magic. It's where information is passed from A to B with no direct experience and no direct knowledge. So keeping a journal and and etch, you, you've touched on the first thing. You've got there. You felt that yourself. That's your opening. That's your awakening. And then from there, just keep at it. People, when they're first experiencing things, they want a lot of guidance and They want a lot of understanding and feedback and things like that. That's just normal and natural, but it's not actually that helpful, Not especially not in the early stages, is learning to imagine you're the only person in the world that does magic and experiences things. So you write them down and you start to learn by developing yourself and looking at your own development. And then when you come to read the writings of philosophers and mystics and looking at translations of different early religious writings, you start to recognize, oh, I recognize that. I know what they're talking about. So that you start to really understand the previous generations from the inside because you're experiencing the same that they did. And you don't then go backwards to do their work. You move forwards to develop your own work. And as you're going down the path of learning, you pick up techniques and skills and tools that enable that innate quality within you to grow and expand. That's a very healthy way. That's how a lot of how I learned magic was realizing that there was a lot of dogma and doing my own thing and keeping a log and then recognizing it in writings from, you know, a few hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. And realizing that I was on a path that other people had walked themselves. And so you walk and you leave your crumbs behind to expand. So each time there's an evolution, people stretch a bit further. As our consciousness expands, we stretch further. So, yeah, Etch, keep going with it. You've touched it. You've found it yourself. That is a magical state. Keep a log. Keep a journal. Just let it flow. Let it. Magic is very natural. Let it do its thing with you see where it goes. Josephine, as well, you mentioned that importance of direct experience and knowing when you've made contact or knowing when you're in another realm, basically looking for those specific signals. And we have another listener question from Etch that is tangentially related, where Etch is saying, Josephine, how does one confirm the presence of a ghost? At my place of work, a store, there have been sightings, quote unquote, of a ghost on more than one occasion. However, I'm skeptical. The backstory is that over a couple decades ago, a store manager was murdered in the basement. 
The last sighting took place in the same basement. How would I, Josephine, determine if a ghost does in fact exist in the building? Well, my first question back would be, why would you need to? Is there a suspected ghost causing serious harm or problems, for example? To answer the the question, the short answer is there's no off-the-shelf 100% test sequence for such things. That's, That's movie stuff. And really, a ghost that's not causing a problem should just be left alone. It's, oh, my God, there's a fly in the building. Well, so what? You know, I think part of this is getting over the mentality that anything that's not within your normal range is something that's terribly weird and needs to be heavily investigated and dealt with, which is not the case. We're surrounded by things we don't understand. And if it's not intruding on you and not causing any problems, it just is what it is. And it's very much about, God, it's going to sound very Christian, is this, of be like the child. A child just accepts some things and, and it's not harming them. It's it, it, curiosity. Curiosity is great, but it's just like, it just is what it is. But to, to expand on that, a presence in the building can be all manner of different things from the magical, the spirit, to bad wiring and plumbing and drama. There's always a lot of drama involved in people. It takes knowledge and direct experience over time to build up the skills to be able to ascertain what it is that's there. It's not something you can write up in a paragraph or just off-the-cuff remark. In terms of actual ghosts, which are not common, by the way, there are two basic types. One is an actual dead person. And for the most part, that tends not to last beyond a year or two after the death. Depending on variables, they can last a lot longer depending on how the death happened. But that is rare, especially in modern times. How we perceive death in life and how we deal with death, as in, you know, do we bury, do we burn, do we do this to the body? But particularly the beliefs of the person when they're alive have quite a strong influence on what they do when they die, whether they move forward, whether they don't. So, you know, you also have to take that into account. But long-lasting ghosts tend to be very rare. The more common one is the recording. And that's where there's an energetic snapshot of a person or event that becomes embedded in the building and something can trigger it to replay every so often. And for the most part, ghost sightings tend to be these recordings. And they tend to happen when there's a lot of stress around the death of the person or or it was violent or, you know, where there was a lot of inner energy coming and intersecting together at at that point of death. And sometimes the recordings are not even the death. It's an event where lots of, from an inner perspective, lots of energetic intersections came together in what, from a a living point of view, a physical point of view, is a very high adrenal situation. And, you know, living in an old country like Britain, we do see these recordings every so often. There's a very famous one. There's actually some work in the course around it in York, where in the basement of a building, and it was a, a girls' school, the building was actually sat on top of an old Roman road, And for years and years, generations, every so often, somebody would spot a load of Roman soldiers marching through the building. And this this was causing all sorts of problems, not because the recording was causing problems, because it was freaking people out. The owners of the building didn't realise there was a a Roman road underneath until they excavated it. And it was a high adrenal situation where suddenly all these soldiers were called together and it left a recording somehow on the road, which the building was then built on top of. And these things, they're harmless, they're natural, and we're surrounded by them. More troublesome ghost presences that I've attended as an exorcist, very, very few of them were actually dead people. Most of them were land beings that were playing up. Some were parasites, some were underworld beings, some were raccoons, those little fuckers. Many were ghost recordings embedded in a building. Some of them we managed to trace to terrible events embedded in a building. Some were dead people in distress or clinging, where they realised they were dead and didn't want to be dead, and so they clung on. 
But the majority of situations I would get dragged out to, there'd actually be absolutely nothing from an inner perspective going on. It was all mundane stuff with a lot of drama thrown in. The terrible events type of issue is, is one that's often mistaken as a haunting and can present like a haunting, but technically it's not. And it's where most of the time there's a death that's violent, like accidents, mass shootings, and it embeds into the fabric of the space. And where there was a parasitic person involved, like in a mass shooting or a rape murder, the energetic inner fabric of the space becomes disordered. There's, I don't have a better word for it, but it's like very badly disordered. And that becomes a festering sore for parasites to feed off of, which in turn attracts destructive beings, which is a natural mechanism. And the way we experience this as living humans is a space that seems dark and dirty no matter how much light and cleaning happens, where people have bad dreams, illnesses, where strange and bad things happen all the time. And where sensitive people get a sense of fear or dread when they enter the space, it's not mild reactions, it's very severe reactions. And these types of spaces tend to trigger these big reactions and, and people think they're haunted. And by the way, if you hear some wheezing and strange noises in the background, Colin, my cat, has come to join us and he has long-term health issues. So if you, it's not somebody dying in the corner, it's just my cat. Please give Colin our best. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, he tends to purr into the laptop microphone and then wheeze into it. He's here. He's helping. As long as he didn't stand on the, on the laptop. Those sort of building issues can be a hell of a job to get rid of, and it takes a long time to clean them up. And it's one of the reasons why in a lot of older cultures, when something like this happens, they just burn the building down because it, it's just such a job to clean them up. And not in direct relation to the question, but just to put this out there, I do still get a lot of emails each week from people asking for my help as an exorcist. And I have to turn all of them down for two reasons. So any listeners, if you're thinking, oh, I need to call or email or no, you don't, just don't. The first thing is that although the people often feel their situation is dire, it's not, not really. And the answer often lays within themselves and how they need to clean themselves up because often the living human is an element of the pattern. And the second reason is that such work is very taxing physically and energetically. And I'm now too old to do that work safely. I don't refer people and I don't give advice, direct advice on this sort of thing because when you've been doing this for a long time, it's very easy to make energetic connections very quickly. And when I give advice directly to someone or even a referral, it immediately creates a connection between me and the situation. And it's very difficult to switch that off. And I'm energetically too old to carry those sort of connections anymore. And it's another thing that people don't understand when they start to tread that path in magic of exorcism is it is the hardest type of magic to do. It takes the most out of you physically, energetically, mentally, and emotionally. And there's only a short span of time that you can do it for. You know, a decade is a max, and then you're done. And after that, you should not connect in any way with people wanting you to do that work because it will set up a connection and it will just suck the life force out of you. The other issue is that people want quick fixes. They want spells, magical workings, distance healing, a recipe magic, a ritual that they can do themselves. Or they want it dealt with by somebody else that can just go in, wave a wand, and it's all done and they can get on with their lives. But 99% of the time, the person themselves at the core of the issue is the key. They don't want to change their behavior. They don't want to walk away from the situation. They don't want to clean themselves up. They don't want to stop doing things. It's, it's When I was talking to you earlier before we started recording about this sort of thing, it's akin to a diabetic with type 2 diabetes that's come from years of bad diet. Is They just want a pill. They don't want to change their diet. They don't want to stop eating sugar and carbohydrates. They just want a pill to make them better. 
and it, it doesn't work with like that. The pill manages the symptoms. It doesn't cure the problem. And so the problem ends up digging in deeper and deeper and deeper. And these days, like with type 2 diabetes, doctors have given up just, you know, saying you need to change your lifestyle. You really need to get on top of this. They just give them the pill because they know they're going to spend hours with that patient who is just going to completely ignore everything they say and go back to doing what they want to do because people don't want to change. People don't want a bit of hardship. They don't want to have no said to them. And it's exactly the same in exorcism. 99% of the time, the person is part of the issue and they don't want to change. Um, they don't want to let go of something. And when you do tell them what they need to do, it's not glamorous enough for them. And it's hard work and it means change. And I used to spend months helping people and cleaning them up and burning myself out doing things for them. And they would just get right back into the same mess because they just didn't want to change. So I eventually got to the point of saying, no, that's enough. People need to take responsibility for themselves. And that's sort of gone far away from what Etch was, was asking about. So Etch, no, there's not a quick, easy, 100% way to tell that the sighting that's been seen is the dead person. If you wanted to magically test that, what you could do is go in into the basement one day and do a ritual cleaning, which, you know, the method for doing that is actually quite basic. It's not glamorous and it's pretty effective. And that's in Apprentice Module 1 in Lesson 7. The students learn right from the, the first step how to clean the space, how to clean themselves how to look from an inner perspective. And, you know, the students who just sort of dance through that module quickly to get it done so they can tick the boxes don't get the skill. Students who see those, those lessons as, okay, these are things that then are foundation practices that I need to keep doing and practicing and getting very good at because they will set me in good stead for the rest of my life those students are the ones that will become kick-ass magicians. Any sort of study like this, if you just skip through to get done, you're not going to become a magician. All you're doing is gathering information and doing an exercise because I told you to. But there's some exercises within Module 1, which one of them is learning how to look around a building using inner vision. And the students just test it on themselves and walking around their own building getting used to the idea of doing that. But you can use that as a diagnostic to look in a building to see what the problem is. And it's not one where you can take it off the shelf and go, oh, that's that technique, right, I'm going to go do it. It doesn't work like that. You work with it and work with it until it becomes a second nature, until you start noticing inner patterns that you see, inner presentations, and then you go to that room and look from the physical aspect and you can start to see, oh, that's what a cat looks like from an inner perspective. It doesn't look anything like a cat. Oh, in the mirror, I don't look like me. I don't look like anything really. Oh, there's a really weird colour in the corner and it seems to be buzzing. I'll go and have a look in that corner. Oh, shit, the wiring's cracked. It's an exercise that you develop like a muscle. So if you are doing the course and you've done those exercises, get good at them. And then one day when you're taking a break, make it look like you're just sitting quietly or meditating in the corner and, and go in your mind down into the basement, have a look around, see what you see. Don't project anything in your mind. Don't expect anything. Just, just go see what presents. And if you get the feeling that it needs cleaning, if you can access it, go and ritually clean it. You can do it in five minutes and it's done. And then if it doesn't come back again, you know, it's, it's gone. And it's nothing that harms if it is a dead person that's clinging on. That type of ritual cleaning won't do them any harm. It will just stop them expressing in that space. It just wipes it a bit. They might come back in three, four months. That can happen particularly if, it's a, if it is a dead person. That will just clean them up for a little while and then they'll come back. If it's a recording, it might wipe it completely. So you can actually do your own experimentation. 
which will teach you basic exorcism techniques at the same time. And again, this is about magical learning, is use the skills that you're developing and work with them. They're not theory. They're actual working techniques. Get really good at them and then use them. I think this actually leads into an interesting question from Anonymous, who is saying, Josephine, when I talk to older people that were brought up in villages in less developed countries, it seems like they were more sensitive to magical visions or dreams from spirits and deities, despite not being magicians. On the other hand, the younger generation who are in their 20s and brought up in more urban areas in either their home countries or the U.S. are bricks, not as sensitive as the older generation, even if they perform the same spiritual practices as the older generation. Have you, Josephine, noticed this yourself? And if so, what do you think is the cause of this? Are people who live in rural areas more sensitive than people who live in major suburbs or cities? Or has the development of technology in recent years bombarded our minds with so much background noise that more of us are bricks? Or has technology thickened the veils somehow? I think it's not so much a matter of where someone lives. There is an aspect of that, but how they think. Living in the countryside long term can open out your natural sensitivity, whereas a city can shut it down. It's an energetic thing. In a city, you have a lot of people in a very small space. You have a lot of things going on all the time, bad and good. So you are bombarded all the time. And you have to develop a thicker skin in order to survive there. It's, a na- it's not something intentional. It's something natural that your body will do. I can't live in cities. You know, a year and I'm done. It literally energetically kills me to live in a city. When you're out living in the countryside, your inner defense mechanism is not triggered every 30 seconds. You can actually unfold in a much better way. So you do pick up on more things from a a sensitivity point of view. But it's also about how we think. Older generations, of which I am, is we were brought up running wild, basically. And also, there was a lot that developed our imagination. And in magic, the imagination is, is very important. Not that your imagination runs everything, but it becomes a vehicle for things. And we lived very magical lives as children, you know, stories, playing out, talking to things, taking things at face value. Oh, that's a healing spring. Oh, good. Right. I'll go drink from that. You don't think, oh, maybe I need to get some of that water and have it scientifically analyzed to see what's making it healing. That's a shift in thinking. And there's nothing wrong with scientific thinking. It's learning to have the sort of inner looseness, imagination, childlike quality, and also the rational side of you living with each other as, you know, sometimes in couples, totally different personalities can become a really good mix. Well, it's it's the same thing. I notice in a lot of younger generation magicians, when they're first starting out, I'll get a lot of questions about how do you prove this? How do you rationally prove that? How do you rationally prove this? Why do you need to? If it works, it works. And if you've experienced it as working and it works consistently, then you can start to say, well, that's really interesting. I wonder what's happening there. But you have to go through those experiences for yourself first so that you have a control and that you have um, a set point to work from. If you're constantly questioning the rationality of something, it shuts that side of the brain down. And a lot of the childhood experiences and freedoms that my generation had, the younger generation doesn't have at all. And especially if they're raised in cities, they can't just go out the door and disappear for 12 hours without saying where they're going at the age of eight, which is what we did. There's way too many people, way too many things happening, and it's too dangerous. So the way that a child is raised, everything is managed, and everything is now geared towards passing tests and, you know, going towards a certain job and things like that. It becomes very rational. So that kills that childhood side of the inner spirit, 
for want of a better word. But you can live like that as an adult in a city. It's difficult, but you can. And, and I think that's basically what's going on with those situations is, you know, the living environment, your natural inner ability. It's not that you're a break. It's that your inner immune system is going, hell no, and putting up barriers. And I bet a lot of bricks who move to live in the country within two or three years would find that they're not bricks anymore. It, it would take a while for their inner immune system to calm down and, and bring the bricks down. And then they would start to experience things. Just as an aside with that, I live out in the countryside and it's a very small village and surrounded by moorland. Over the last few years, more and more city people have started to move into the village. Not a lot, but enough that we notice. And there's, there's a guy who lives down the road from me and I can sort of see his house from my front window. And there's a big hedge around it. And a lot of the hedging here is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Some of it's uh, back to Saxon times at the Saxon boundaries. And this hedge, it's a mixture of different trees and bushes. And when he first moved in, he was out every fucking week, clipping it within an inch of its life. He would get gardeners in and his long hedge round his detached bungalow would be absolutely perfect every time. And he would have his friends round from the city and they'd sit in the garden that's very clipped and organised and socialise, you know, over champagne or whatever. But I've noticed over the last sort of year or so, he stopped doing that. He's letting the hedging grow a bit. He's letting some of the trees grow. He's letting some of the wildflowers grow. He's not having his uh, champagne clinking, you know, sessions with his friends from the city. He's actually getting his hands dirty in the garden and he's going out for walks and things. His bricks are coming down and he's starting to become empathic with the nature that surrounds him and starting to interact with it very slowly on an outer level. And that's what living in the countryside does for you, is it very slowly steps down that concrete wall that we have to put up to live in the city and, and lets it come down and unfold. So for magicians that do live in cities, being aware that that's most likely the mechanism that's happening, you can then learn to work within that in various different ways. And, and one is getting out every so often and for the day and touching base in nature so that you can just, your immune system can take a breath. But also finding ways to stretch over that wall to energetically connect with things without bringing that wall down, which would put you in danger. One of the things that you can do as a de-bricking exercise without de-bricking yourself, again, is in module one, quarry training. And you can't do this because the pandemic now, but you can actually do it in other people's houses, is get your hands really clean first. Um, salt and water and soap. You know, what I do is put a little bit, pile of salt in the palm of my hand, and then some liquid soap, and I give my hands a really good scrub over and wash, and your hands feel really clean. If you don't get that feeling of cleanness after that, then you consecrate the salt, which again is in module one, and then do it. And get that feeling of cleanness, and do that every day, maybe two or three times a day for about a week or two, until you start to feel the difference between clean and dirty around your own home in your hands. And then when you've got to that stage, then go into someone else's house or, or junk shops, charity shops are great for this. Handle things that other people have worn and that have lived with and see how your hands feel when you come out and whether they feel sticky, slightly sticky or slightly. It's a, it can be a physical feel as well as an inner feel because it feels slightly sticky and gammy. And if you wash your hands with consecrated salt, soap and water afterwards, how the clean feeling feels. That tells you you're not a break. That tells you you do have sensitivity. It's just that you're either constantly living with a sub-level of energetic dirt all the time, so you're just becoming used to it, 
or your brick walls are, are really tough because you live in an area where you need to live like that or both. And then you can start to make decisions in the long term about your life. You know, if magic is a side issue in your life and living in the city is, is the main part of your life, then then you know you're gonna you're gonna hit some barriers in magic, but you know what that barrier is, which makes it easier to deal with. If magic is your life and your job is, uh, or, or the reason you live in the city is secondary, then move out. I did that when I, I went for a job in Milwaukee from California. And the job was supposed to be working for Milwaukee Ballet. In the process of me moving house, selling everything, getting rid of everything, and going to Milwaukee, the director and the executive of the companies walked out. And so I didn't have a job because it's one of the things with ballet directors, often they'll take their staff with them and the new incoming doesn't want anything to do with what the last director worked with. So suddenly I was in a city with no job and two kids. You know, I had to scramble to find lots of different jobs and I eventually found a job, a part-time job with another ballet company and waitressing jobs and bartending jobs and cleaning jobs. I, I did anything that I could to keep the income coming in. And I realized over that year, my energy was going down, 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 down. I was getting depressed. Energetically, I was getting ill and I couldn't connect with anything. And it was the worst year of my life. It was horrible. I did ask for help. I just opened the gates and put it out there like, I've reached my limit. I cannot do this without dying, I need some help. And the help came and the help was a series of fating connections that plucked me out of Milwaukee and dumped me in West Montana, out in the middle of the wilderness. So it was one extreme to the other, where I could heal and grow again. Everywhere I'd gone, magic is, because magic is my life. It's the reason I breathe and exist. It's the reason I do everything. Ballet was my second, that was my career that just kept derailing because basically it was interfering with the magic. And then the rest of, in terms of income, I was willing to do whatever mundane jobs I was capable of doing for however long or short to bring in income to provide for my children. So it's how you want to develop your life and what is important to you and what's not important to you. You know, if someone really wants to be magical and live a magical life and they live in a city is to seriously look if there's planning either short term or long term where you can carry on doing what you need to do, but you can live outside the city as near to nature as you can will vastly help. So, yes, Anonymous, it's not about that people are bricks. It's about your environment and your inner immune system. For some reason, Josephine, I'm reminded of one of the first things you said in the first podcast that we did where you shared that effectively, and I'm paraphrasing, if you're waiting for the perfect time to do magic or to engage in esotericism or the perfect location or the perfect situation, it's never going to happen that, that you have to work with where you are in, in many respects. Yeah, basically do it. And the blocks and difficulties that you find along the way Instead of seeing them as blocks and difficulties, what they're actually doing is it's fate intersections. As, as the more you engage in magic, the more your fate patterns start to strengthen and change to put you in places and cross paths with people that are necessary for the next step. And you learn to navigate. It's like navigating a river. You learn to navigate with those shifts and, and be willing to let go. I mean, again, one of the very early exercises in Quarrier is about learning to let go, learning to give things away, learning to throw things away. People don't want to change and they don't want to let go and they don't want hardship. They don't want difficulty. If you don't want any of those things, don't do magic, basically, because your early lessons, it's like going from, if you've had children, you'll understand this, from a toddler who thinks the world revolves around them and they want everything to be right for them and they will throw a tantrum if they don't get their own way, to a child of eight or nine who understands that sometimes you have to be patient and wait 
you want to tell mummy something now, but mummy is talking to an adult. Mummy has signaled that she's seen you. She knows you want to say something. And as soon as her sentence is finished with this person, then she'll give her attention to you, but you have to wait. And it's that sort of growing up training that happens in the early stages of magic. There is no perfect timing. There is no perfect place. What you have to do is, does this place work for me? Does this life situation, does this job, does this relationship, is it for working for me for where I want to go and what I want to do? If not, in a, in, if it's a big not, then change needs to happen. You can't have it all, basically. And also, it's be, about being fluid. You really need to be fluid with your life with magic and be willing to shift and change. And if you ask for help, don't then grumble when the help comes in a really difficult way. The amount of times I've raged at the universe because something really bad has crossed my path or happened. But in retrospect, it was absolutely necessary at that point to kick me out of something and move me to a place where I needed to be. The opposite side of that is being passive and just going with the flow to the extent of, you know, just flopping around like a dead fish. It really takes intelligence and thoughtfulness and self-reflection to really go through these sort of issues. Josephine, as well, we have a, a few listener questions regarding specific aspects of this broad category that you kind of sketched out, which is about the conscious mind, energetic boundaries, and things like that. For instance, we have a listener question from Love Jungle, who is asking, is there a relationship, Josephine, between enlightenment, as described in Buddhism or Hinduism, and magic. Do you know of any magicians who have reached any of the various stages of enlightenment, non-duality, dissolution of self? Is there a path of enlightenment in magical practice? Well, the first thing I'd, I'd ask is, what does enlightenment mean? And what does it mean to this person? When you're looking at Buddhism, Hinduism, any of the religions, these are dogmatic religions. And just because they're on the other side of the world and they wear cool outfits doesn't mean they're any different to any other dogmatic religion like Christianity, Judaism, all, all of the other religions. Mm -hmm. And they all have these, these shining goals mm -hmm. up in the sky. There's an element of truth in all of them. I'm not saying that, that these are all wrong. It's just that the dogma that has built up over time around these sort of shining lights in the distance, basically, for one, stop the person getting there. And it's not a getting there. When you think about the word enlightenment, what does it mean? It's the opposite meaning of ignorance. It's being awake as opposed to being asleep, which is what makes me laugh when, I, you know, the over the last few years, especially the last sort of three or four years, we've had this polarized political and, and social agenda going on. And when people on one side say something, the other side says, oh, we're so woke, are we? You know, as an insult. Well, what's the opposite of woke? It's asleep, being a zombie. All that enlightenment means is that you're not ignorant. Enlightenment isn't a grandiose sort of pinnacle of greatness. It means, it, all it means is you're not blind anymore. You're no longer completely blind and you have to then learn how to navigate life while seeing. Just from a physical perspective, you, as, a, as an analogy, when someone has been blind all their life or the majority of their life and are given sight back, it's a long process of learning how to see, because it's not that seeing just switches on. The eyes can see, but the brain can't make sense of what the eyes are seeing. And I remember years ago watching a movie about a woman who'd always been blind and had this operation and, which enabled her to see. And she was so excited about being able to get sight. But when she was seeing, her brain couldn't organize what it was seeing. You know, that noise, is that coming from the gorilla in the cage? Is it the cage making that noise? Is it the airplane flying over the cage that's making that noise? There's, there was no reference points for the brain. Waking up, coming out of ignorance is exactly the same. It's not a, 
oh, you have an initiation or somebody touches you and suddenly you're enlightened. It's a lifetime process of becoming less ignorant, you know, and once you're not blind and you can see, as you learn to process the seeing, you begin to see all the bullshit, all the dogma in everything. You know right from wrong once you can see and the stakes get higher. This is a very deep, mystical and magical thing that a lot of people don't seem to understand. And yet it's repeated in mysticism and philosophy and has been for thousands of years is when you don't know better, you're innocent to an extent. When you do know better, you are guilty as fuck. And this is what magicians talk about when they're talking about the narrowing of the path. When you're walking a magical path or a mystical path or a religious path or a science path for this matter, the deeper on the path that you get, the more you learn, the more you start to see, the more you start to see the bullshit, the mistakes, the dogma, the crap. And the lonelier it gets because you're surrounded by bullshit and dogma and crap. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And if you then go, oh, well, pff, whatever, everyone's like this, and knowingly join in that bullshit and dogma and crap, the magical whiplash from that gets stronger and stronger. This is talked about in, in a lot of myths and a lot of magical stories. One of the examples I give to the students, because we, we talk about this later on in the course, is the Sword of Damocles, you know, the Sword of the King, that hangs over the king's head by a thread. Um, because he bears all the responsibility, he can see he's not ignorant. And so that sword is over him, held by an angel, held by a very thin thread, so that if he does bad knowing that it's bad because he can see that thread breaks and the sword impales him. Actually, this, it's just occurred to me this when I was, this is like a tiny, tiny, teeny example of it. When I was in my teenage years and, uh, you know, sort of dipping my feet into the early stages of magic and divination, stuff like that, I was a bit of a shit when I was a teenager. I, I was always partying, drinking, fighting, you name it. There was a jacket that I loved. I absolutely adored this jacket and I wore it everywhere. I left it in the back of someone's car seat and it, it was there for a while and I meant to keep going and getting it. And in the meantime, I was walking through a department store and there was all these nice pretty bottles and perfume and this, that and the other. That, that in these days, they didn't put everything behind the counter. It, it, it was out on the counter. And there was nobody around. And I thought, hmm, because I didn't have any money or anything. And I thought, ooh, they make lots of money out of this shit. So I'm justified. And stole a bottle of perfume and got home. And I was very proud of myself. I'd managed to actually pull it off. Three days later, I went around to my friend's house to get my jacket. And someone had broken into her car and stolen my favorite jacket. And that night I had a dream. And it was sort of a mundane dream, but this face appeared at the window and the window was open. And this is one of the signals that I didn't realize at the time, but I get this in life now. In dreams, when I suddenly zoom in a mundane dream to a window that's open and somebody talking through it, it's an inner contact trying to connect to me. And this, I had this dream, this window opened and this voice just said, did you get that? I woke up and didn't make the connection straight away. And I was sat outside having a coffee and a cigarette. And it's suddenly like, shit, yeah. I knew it was wrong to steal. I knew ethically. I knew not just legally, that ethically it's wrong to, it didn't belong to me. It's not a matter of, oh, they can afford it or I can justify it because they rip people off and things like that. That's their problem. That is not your bad. Your bad is what you do. And that was bad of me to do that. And this was my toddler training. You know, you do not do that. And this is what it feels like to have something stolen from you. This is what it feels like to lose something that you love. And that was a very necessary life lesson for me as that bomb-headed teenager. 
And that's the beginning of the path. That's the beginning of what people call enlightenment. It isn't this saintly thing that's this high pinnacle. It's everyday awakening, seeing and knowing. There's loads of different paths that can, that can trigger awakening. It's not about being magical or spiritual or mystical. It's about being aware. It's about the truth within yourself and, and being honest with yourself. You could have a plumber that through his or her work becomes awakened, becomes enlightened, because it's about the individual, their choices, their actions, their steps, what they pay attention to, what they see and understand and take from that, and then engage that within their life step by step by step. And in magic and in religion and in mysticism, that starts to open the doors to other worlds, to connecting with other beings and learning to work with that same integrity. And it's not about, you know, Disney realm. It's about absolute integrity in, in how you work. Over the years, I've met many monks and talked to them, both male and female, from various religions, and some who have claimed stages of enlightenment and who also claim to dispense it through initiations and paths. And without exception, every one of those people making those claims were complete dickheads or about as enlightened as a brick. And some of them were just plain nasty when they let their guard down. And it, it was one of the things that was a big eye opener for me in my 30s, living in California. You know, I was doing a lot of magical teaching. And so you cross paths, you know, conferences, things like that. You cross paths with all these different types of people and people making claims. Very cool looking Tibetans in outfits, very cool looking Indians in outfits, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Some of them were just breaks and they were doing no harm. I did meet some monks, just, just the odd one that were just shining, that were just really good mystical people, but the majority of them were just pieces of shit. And I've met people who are totally not spiritual in any sense of the word, that atheists, rationalists, blah, de, blah, de, blah. But that light of awakeness and truth just shines out of them. They're not locked into a mundane awareness. They see through it for what it is. And their path, their mysticism, magic, religion, science, is their vocabulary for seeing and seeing things as they are. And the big thing that to me that I would say is an enlightened person is someone that is not only awoken and can see things for what they are, they can see and they can live and function within that seeing, which is incredibly hard. And being able to do that and maintain that is very, very special. But that's not a religious thing. It's not a magical thing. And anyone who claims to teach that is full of shit because you can't teach it. What you can do is guide people through their lives, be there a plumber, a magician, a scientist, whatever, through a vocabulary, through the vocabulary of science, of magic, of mysticism, of religion, to wake up and to see. St. Francis of Assisi, some of his writing, he was seeing and it was beautiful with it. He was seeing it from within the pattern of being a Christian monk. But he saw through the bullshit. He saw through the hatred. He saw through the separation between human and nature. So when you see it in people, you recognize it. It's not about claims and workshops and initiations and awakenings and stuff like that. It's a process. It's a process of living. So don't look for such things in a path. Look for it within yourself. Look for your everyday actions. Observe the world around you. Pay attention. The world will show you its illusions if you're willing to pay attention. It will show you the best path for you as an individual to walk, to bring that awakeness to the life within you. And you walk it one step at a time, one life lesson at a time, you see and you live with that seeing while surrounded by blindness. That is an incredibly powerful point. And, and as you just mentioned, Josephine, you can't teach 
this, but you can guide people through and, and kind of open up possibilities and areas of exploration. And I, my mind jumped to an earlier point you made, Josephine, which is when you're talking about family and your children and how they grow up independent beings and respecting the decisions that they make. And I think this flows with a question we have for you from Laura M. Navarez, who is asking Josephine, do soul families, soulmates, and twin flames exist? If they do exist, how do you recognize them? I see a lot of this stuff floating around the internet, and I just sit there and blink. I've come across souls whose fates do intersect, and I don't see that as soulmates or soul families or twin flames, and that's all especially this is all very 19th century language. This is going back into theosophy. When we experience these sorts of things, we need to box it. We need to organize it. We need to turn it into information that is easily picked off a shelf and absorbed and understood without being understood. Like everything else in religion, mysticism, magic, this whole fate, soul issue is boxed, organized, categorized, bullet-pointed, so it's easy to digest. I've never come across that in that format in real magical life. It, it just doesn't seem to exist. What does seem to exist, and which is where I think this categorizations came from, is that you get souls whose fates seem to keep intersecting or where there's patterns of fate that seem to run between people, sometimes repeatedly. But the majority of the categorizations is just that, I think, often is a product of the sorry state in which we find ourselves in, in modern life is because we're so isolated from each other. And we do have these strange experiences. But there's also, I think, a lack of differentiating between the body and the spirit, which we talked about earlier. And this is just purely from my own experience. So it might be totally wrong for everyone else. I don't know. I can only go from my own experiences. Is that there is no time outside of physical substance. So time is just got lives going on. Everything is, is just these patterns that are constantly interconnecting. And you find that you know someone. And it's, it's quite a deep feeling. And that's the difference between falling in love with someone. When you fall in love with someone, your body, your biology kicks off and your biology and your brain go on to this huge party of, oh my God, we're so deeply connected. I feel like soul partners and soulmates and we're twin flames and, and this, that and the other. And then 10 years later, you're tearing each other's throat out and you can't stand each other. What went wrong? You know, that's nothing to do with soul families and soulmates. That's, you know, two people who really connected and were good together and then grew in opposite directions. That's just normal. You know, this whole fantasy that people stay together, you know, they meet at 16 and stay together for the rest of their lives. Very rarely that does happen. Sometimes they stay together because, you know, that's what society expects and that's what their families expect and they don't have the guts to get out. Most of the time, it all just falls apart. That's all our biology. And it's learning to separate out what's biology and what's something else. And I have come across people where I've walked into a room and I've immediately known who that person was. Not their name and address, but I know who they are. I know their personality. I know what they know and what they don't know. I've known them. I know them somewhere else. And, you know, there's some friends that I have where it's like we both come from the same pattern, I think is the way. I, I, I wouldn't call it soul family. I think it's, it's like a, a fate pattern that souls come in and out of or that spirits come in and out of mid-sect with mm -hmm. and that we're in the same pattern. And so we resonate at, at the same frequency at a very deep level. You know, with children knowing the child the moment they were born. And that wasn't a biology thing. I, I knew this child. Another child, I didn't know that child. I loved that child intensely. 
the same maternal feelings, but they were a new soul and it was very interesting. It's like, oh, hello, we're going to make friends and we're going to have fun and we're going to fight. This is going to be cool. Whereas the other one, it was like, oh, it's you again. My answer to that would be, don't try and pin the information down, is observe. And again, journal, observe, journal, listen, watch. I think we learn far more magically by doing that than by reading classifications of stuff. I do think that there are fate families, which are not about souls and and stuff. There are huge, long fate patterns that need to achieve something. And where certain spirits, their needs are also going to be addressed by traveling within that fate pattern. So they interlock and connect with each other because they're, they're all trying to achieve the same thing. And to me, magic and all of this is, is natural. It's inner nature. Inner nature is just as good at being efficient and recycling as outer nature is. If you can kill 10 birds with one stone, go for it. And that's to me how this happens is that there's lots of different levels and layers going on to do with individual fate, the fate of groups of people, the fate of nations. They're all intersected and they come and connect in these intersections and then disconnect when it's no longer necessary. And I think that's what's happening and that's what people are picking up on when they talk about things. Magically, Yes and no. You can actually force a soul to manifest through a certain line, through a certain genetic line, but only if the fate patterns that that soul is interconnecting with has a fate fragment where it would serve a purpose, you can engineer it so that they come through. And to me, that's an actual really bad thing to do. Not just ethics, it's just magically so much can go wrong with that. But I think that's what's happening with... The whole thing in Tibet with leaders reincarnating within a particular line, coming back over and over again of the same soul to connect in and carry on a job, which is not what they used to do. That It's a relatively modern thing for them a few hundred years. And to me, it's quite abusive. And it also blocks naturally forming fate patterns. It blocks out certain spirits that need to manifest in certain places for certain things. It blocks so many things out. It's very degenerate and causes so many problems. And I'm not surprised of the problems that the system within Tibet sees because of the way they're handling stuff like this. And I'm sure that's going to piss off a lot of people, but you know what? Fuck you. Sorry. (laughs) It's just somebody needs to say these sort of things sometimes. But yeah, interesting stuff. I would suggest, Laura, Step back from the the listing, you know, the the organization sort of aspect of this. Step back from it, but don't step back from the concept. Just start thinking and, and observing and, and looking actually, looking in your own life and journaling and not, not jumping to conclusions, but leaving leaving questions open in your brain to see what you come back to in five or six years' time. I think we're connected to people all over the place all the time. It's just not what I think we think it is. And I think that the emotional Disney realm kicks in because we are so isolated these days. When it comes to different being or contact consciousness or how we even use names and magic for beings and deities, or or if you're dealing with an abstract name, can you share with listeners what, what are the key things that they should know about how to approach this? Well, the first thing is, is that, Understanding ourselves as humans and understanding how we function and how our brains function. And, you know, right from the offset, most people totally ignore this, but I think that's a stupid thing to ignore, is I always say, know yourself. And that's not just psychological and spiritual. It's actually know your own physical body. I'm just blown away by the amount of people that don't know about their own biology. And it doesn't mean you have to go on a biology course is, you know, learn where your organs are, learn what they do, learn how to look after them, learn how your brain works, learn how your brain and endocrine system can drive your emotions and your perceptions. 
really be aware first of yourself and then start to look at religion, magic, mysticism, the cultural programming, the dogma, the different beings, their names of them, their functions, how people perceive them in, in different cultures and different religions. And at first you see this, this just sort of dizzying array of different kinds and names and different beings and, and what they supposedly are. And, you know, from a an atheist perspective, it just looks like, you know, the world is completely mad and has lots of imaginary friends and that they fight over whose imaginary friend is better than the other one, which to an extent is, is true because this classification and organisation that I've been talking about was helpful maybe a thousand years ago, maybe 2,000 years ago. It was also good marketing, by the way, really early marketing. But we've evolved, hopefully, emotionally and intellectually, we've evolved. We don't need that. We can start to question that and tear it apart, keep what's useful and dump the rest. And again, back to your own experiences and journaling your own experiences so you can look back on them. Once I was watching this discussion going on online about angels and, you know, which religions and which cultures didn't have angels, and that's why they were a bad culture, because they didn't have angels and blah. And it's like, what the fuck are you going on about? Basically, in religions and cultures, they formed from human experiences. You know, people got together. We do have this innate need to connect with what we can't see. And while an atheist would say there's nothing there, I would question that because of my own experiences. Uh, there is very much a lot out there. We just don't understand it. But we do need vocabulary to communicate that and then ways to interact with it and then find out if it's useful or not. And how is it useful? Oh, it does that. Good. Right. Well, there you go. You're in charge of that then. That's how religions form, or it did form, before we then moved on to a, a different era, which, you know, monotheism brought in. You've got a culture. It recognizes these different beings. It recognizes that some are destructive, some are helpful, some are neutral, um, some are very powerful and strong, some are not powerful and strong, but are still useful. Some seem to be like people you knew that are now dead. So there's all these different types of interactions going on and cultures give them classifications. And if you look at very early, and you see it in every religion without exception, you look at the very, very early formation of a religion, you'll find pretty loose classification over a fairly small collection of ideas that functions and that they, they learn to function in. And then as the generations go on, you see that classification starts to get more complex because there's always that one person that comes along that's very anal retentive OCD and needs to control and also wants a platform and wants to be in charge and has to turn around three times before they turn the light on. And I'm not making light of that because I know people that, have to live with that and it's incredibly difficult but that took hold in in religions in priesthoods so, you know you've got that quality running through so it became more and more subdivided more and more rules more and more this more and more control and so you got more and more classifications more rules it gets to the point where all of this blocks your ability to function within an inner world the Egyptians are pretty good at it, in, in, especially in the early stages of their very long culture, was they're basically all spirits, netta. They're just spirits. They didn't have deities, angels, demons, blah. Even though today academics did tend to, they're starting to move away from that now, did put Christianized classifications onto the netta in Egypt the Egyptians were very pragmatic. It's like, hey, it's got no body and it can do things. It's a spirit. And then they had a spirit that would be this name and would do that and have all these, these different things that it flowed through. And then there'd be some spirits that 
tended not to be out in the human world much, but were in the underworld and they tended to work with the dead and they did this. But then when they did come up to the surface, they'd cause all sorts of problems. So they become demons in Christian vocabulary. And all of this becomes bricks and filters that block your ability to connect with things that are out there. And so a lot of it is about learning to very slowly, and it's a lot harder than it sounds to actually step back from that that Western Abrahamic programming to get it out. Even if you're not brought up as a Christian or within the monotheistic religions, it's so embedded within the culture themselves that stepping back from it is incredibly difficult. And so you see when you, for instance, I do a lot of work around Egyptology and reading papers, you know, research papers from Egyptologists and the Christianization comes straight through in, you know, how they're classifying the beings. Oh, this is a demon. That's the God. Oh, those two men, they weren't lovers. Uh, They were just workmates who happened to live together, you know, because it couldn't possibly be anything else. And the fact that they wrote little love letters to each other, it, no, 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 that, that's just friendship. All of this is filters that blocks how we think. So I think in general, one of the things that every magician should do as an exercise is take, say, a month, three months. And when they're reading stuff and doing stuff, is to write it all down and look at it in perspective of, the culture with the underlying religion of that culture. So in the Near East, Middle East, it'd be Islam and Judaism. In the West, it'd be, you know, all three, but specifically Christian, because it's it's been there for so long. An atheist thinks like a Christian and doesn't realise. A magician, an occultist, a pagan, often thinks like a Christian and doesn't realise, and they get really pissed off when you point that out to them and very defensive, which is unnecessary because it's just, you don't need to react like that. You just step back and go, really? Am I or am I not? And look at it. And if you're not, then you come back and you say, no, I'm not. And this is why. Or, oh my God, yes, I am. And this is why. Then you've got a tool to work with that will move you closer to approaching and contacting and working with consciousness that is not physical. I think this kind of flows into your last point with a listener question from Anonymous and also something you touched on earlier in our chat, uh, specifically about political movements. But Anonymous is asking, you've mentioned, Josephine, in your works that sometimes when there's chaos and destruction happening, whether social or political chaos, some of these events are viewed as necessary or good from an inner perspective. With that in mind, do inner contacts have social or political opinions and Has there ever been an instance when you thought certain political or social movements and figures were awful, but were viewed as necessary and important from the lens of the inner worlds? I wouldn't say that in a context of social and political opinions, the only time I've come across that is when the inner contact is human, as in they're either future, past or dead. And often they will push agendas. Dion Fortune was very bad for doing that. She, she would push her on agenda to the point where they had to actually do an exorcism to get her out of the lodge. But in terms of inner contacts and beings in general, no, society and politics is our shit. However, there's political, like at the moment, we're in social and political chaos in, in various different countries for all sorts of different reasons. And... We see those as being bad. It's like we see the pandemic as being bad and it is bad for us. But in the longer term perspective, it can actually be very good and be very necessary. And, and that's, that's the base of is necessity. And if going through a certain change, a destructive change, politically, socially, economically, is actually good for the long term, of the species or of this hive of the species or this nation, then inner beings will work with that destruction. This is where you see destructive beings flowing through a destructive tide, which is kicking off all sorts of bad things 
if you look at that from a Christian perspective, we see those as demons. These are demons that are causing disease and war and blah, and it's all very terrible. And when you're in the middle of it, yeah, it is. But these are not evil beings. It's a being just doing its job. It's breaking something down so that the next thing that needs to happen can happen. And, you know, it opens a new fate possibility. And it's like the, um, I don't know what people call them in America, like roly polies, the little armored insects. And what they do is they clean the soil and people hate them and stamp on them. But actually what they do is clean up heavy metals out of the soil and they break down dead matter. They're doing their job. They're not demons. They're not evil, but they're just doing their thing. So some of these, these events are necessary and, and can be good from an inner perspective, but we perceive them as being very bad. And it's not that the beings that are flowing through these situations have a social or political or religious agenda or anything like that. It's just there is a job there. That needs breaking down and destroying it. And, and the way we do it is, you know, one particular being, well, well, my job is to ensure that that line of people all get this disease. So I will flow through and push and lean on fate patterns to make sure that all those people connect and get those diseases, because at the end of that, this needs to happen, which will move everything forward. If you know your history and you look back at world, in world history at pandemics and destructive situations, a big one that's fascinating to look at magically is in the sixth century in the Near East and, and wider area, it was like one of the Lemony Snicket books, a series of unfortunate events. You have volcanic eruption that brings, you know, possible volcanic winter, plague, war, famine, disease, the whole, the whole shebang. Everything was just torn to pieces. Out of that came different ways of thinking, different ways of being, different ways of organising themselves. It caused a huge shift. The German Renaissance basically happened because of plague beforehand. When you zoom out of our own individual human perspective and the emotional perspective of these sorts of events, then you start to see that actually this is normal and this is necessary. And the inner beings that work and flow through these things are just doing a necessary job. They're not political, they're not social, they're not anti this or pro that, they're just, they're just doing their job. When I was talking about political assholes, I've come across, when I've been teaching divination, I used to teach in groups, and um, what I'd get people to do is, is look at political figures because their life is out in public and because they're making decisions on our behalf and we are paying them to do that and they are making those decisions with our money. It's free game to look at them. So would use politicians. And at the time, there was, there was one particular leader who I considered a complete and utter asshole, an extremely destructive asshole from, and it's not Trump, this was years ago, who was causing all sorts of, you know, pushing certain laws through and things like that and signing off on things that were just disgusting. And I was horrified and I thought, you know, let's have a look at what sort of spirit is this person. And we all did our own readings. And then what we do is compare what we all got. And it was interesting because 99% of the readings all said the same thing, just in slightly different ways. And what was coming out was that this person in their spirit was actually presenting like a monk or a priest and was very balanced and very good. And that just completely threw me a loop. It was like, what the fuck? So I was like, why is this happening? And it was the readings were showing that this person was bringing that destruction through because it was necessary and it was compassionate for a very long-term future. So one decision or one action in that person's life, it could only just be one, it could be a combination, shifted the fate of a nation 
in a different direction that may in the short term be horrific, but in the longer term was actually serving a purpose. That was back in sort of the 90s. And that completely threw me and made me really question fate, long-term patterns, short-term patterns, and what I was actually looking at when I looked at um, situations that were destructive. And that opened up a whole bag load of learning for me about real long-term fate of nations and short-term events and how we view them. And then, so what do we do? Do we just passively go with that? So it brought up a lot of ethical questions for me. And what I came to in the end up was do what is necessary and what you know is right that is within your capability to do. And the rest of it, you cannot do anything about, so you don't even look at it. You focus in on what you can do and what you need to do, what's necessary. A lot of that is to do with re-triggering balancing scales or, or re-triggering a path by walking on it and opening doors, things, very, very simple things like that, but doing it over a long period of time. This sort of subject matter really makes you step back and, and realise that social and political things are very much surface mundane and short-lived. They do things, they burn out, and it's how we react as human beings to these social and political things that define the future and define our magic and define us. It really is back to each individual doing their thing and doing the right thing and not trying to tinker and not trying to block others. Again, it's not about a passive acceptance. It's about waiting and doing what's correct. It's, it's like in this country, we've got the Brexit mess and it really has caused a hell of a mess for so many people. It's looking like it could kick off the violent situation in Northern Ireland again, which, which has been horrific for decades and has only just found some peace. And it's just like, what the fuck are you thinking? You know, because the, the Prime Minister, um, one of the main guys that pushed all of this, eight years ago was saying, if we left Europe, it would be an absolute nightmare. It would destroy our nation. He knows what it does. And he's still done it anyway. As a magician, I'm like, what the fuck? But you have to step back because you don't know the big picture. You don't know the long picture. You do your work. You do the balancing and the cleaning. You do the opening of doors. And the people themselves of this nation voted for this. It was a majority of the people that bothered to get off their ass and go out and vote. A lot of people didn't bother which is a warning. Democracy is very delicate and we each have a responsibility to uphold democracy. And the way you do that is by using your vote and using it wisely, not emotionally. You use it like playing chess. You use it very carefully. And as a magician, most importantly, you vote with intention to bring through necessity and balance. And of course, a lot of people didn't bother to turn out to vote for the referendum. They didn't take it seriously. Some people voted in the referendum as a political comment rather than actually, yes, I want to leave Britain. They just wanted to, you know, kick some dust up. But because it was democratically voted that way, I, as a magician, have to accept that because I live in a democracy. If you try and magically intervene to block that, you're blocking democracy. You're blocking the underpinning structure of the fate of the nation. You don't do that. You can say, oh, well, you know, one magician can't do that. When you look at a rotting structure, you know, a good healthy structure, you can't, and one person can't knock it down. A rotting structure that's on its last legs, one magician can pull one brick out and the whole thing can collapse. The question is, do you pull out that brick? No. What you do is you enable the fate of whatever is necessary to pull that brick out or to shore that wall up. And when it's a democracy, you have to go with the people, as in you have to accept the bad decision. And you work in the background to make the best of it and to open up the future. And inner beings will not get involved in the politics of that. 
still get involved in the necessity. The only beings that get involved in the social and political opinions and manipulations are parasites. So if you ever have an inner contact that is presenting as a deity, an angel, a, a wise inner guide or a hidden master or anything like that, and they're giving you social and political opinions, they're not what they're pretending to be. That's the parasite that's playing on you to manipulate you to do things that will then feed it because actions create energy and emotional actions create emotional energy that it can feed off of. So there's also a caution in there of if you do come across in the contacts that have these social political agendas, either it's just a bunch of parasites that are dressing up or you've got someone who's recently dead who was an adept who is trying to further their agenda. And just because they're an adept doesn't make them a good person. I know some adepts that I, I wouldn't leave a puppy with, that they're just, you know, magic is technique. They are fucking good at their techniques and they are nasty little shits. Be very careful what you talk to, especially when it comes to society and politics. I'm wondering where something like ancestry fits in. And to that point, we have a listener question from Anonymous who's asking how important is ancestry and bloodline and how connected a person can be with certain spirits or a type of magic. Hinduism has a concept of a clan deity or a Kula Devada, where it's believed that as long as the family prays to a clan deity, the deity will watch over and protect the family for generations. There are also indigenous and tribal groups that are closed off to outsiders and say their spirits would only be receptive to the specific tribe. So Anonymous is wondering what your thoughts on all of this are regarding ancestry and bloodline. Well, one issue is vocabulary, which, which I've just talked about. And in the West, we use the, the words deity and spirit to mean two different things, but they're not, basically. It's spirits. And I have to also use that vocabulary, otherwise people don't know what I'm talking about. So you can get trapped in this loop of having to use vocabulary that you know is basically meaningless. There's land spirits, what, you know, some cultures call fairies, some cultures call jinn. There's other names and there's different types, but basically you're talking about nature spirit. Nature spirits tend to have a different concept of time than we do. And I've come across this a lot in um, land and, you know, fairy beings in, in this country. And it's not a new discovery. And, you know, the Reverend Robert Kirk was talking about this hundreds of years ago. With a family, and, and actually it talks about this specific thing, and I've experienced this specific thing. What happens is that, you know, you have you know, an extended family or a, a small tribal group or a small village, and the people, the generations in that family, in that community, we view them as individual people. You know, aunties, uncles, grandmas, great-grandmas, great-great-grandmas, they're all individual people. A land being doesn't see it that way. They see it as one person. It's like, you know, when you have, if you're a gardener and you've got a plant that comes up during summer and in winter it dies back down again and in spring it comes back up, we see that as the same plant. You know, that's like us. We see ourselves as individuals, as a different plant growing every year, but the land being see it as the same plant. You know, especially when you're in a, a shamanic tribal culture, a culture that's very close to nature. And there's a lot of, in Hinduism in particular, there's a lot of underlying shamanism. And we need to find a better word because shamanism is very specific to one culture, one place. But that type of tribal magic is an undercurrent within a lot of localized Hinduism. Because Hinduism is, is like an umbrella of lots of different little religions that all interconnect together. And when you get into clans and villages, you, you get this very sort of tribal, shamanic type of magic and consciousness running through the religion. And hence, it would be seen as a deity. And, but these are basically land spirits. And, and over time, the, the family of the villages build a relationship with this group of spirits or this particular spirit and leaving offerings and doing jobs for them. And the spirit does jobs for you and helps you and protects you. 
And as the generations go on, the, the relationship between the being and the spirit becomes tighter and tighter. And it is very much, it's not about the genetics as such. It's about an ongoing relationship. And so, for instance, you know, I've come across this with fairy families in Ireland, out in the sticks in Ireland, where there's generations of, of a family that interconnect very well with the local land being, and the land being protects them, warns them of illness or danger and things like that, and helps guide them when, when to harvest certain healing plants. And in return, they do help the land being and they leave offerings and, and they do things for nature and they don't touch certain trees or certain bushes because that's where that being lives. So there's, there's a good two-way relationship that builds up. And people that have married into that family and gone to live, you know, in that area, in that little village, becomes part of the family and the being looks after them too. So it's not a genetic, it's definitely not a genetic thing. I think it's very much about long-term relationships and interconnections and, and keeping certain things, certain things going. You do get bloodlines that, that are more sighted than others that it's easier for the land beings to pick up on them and them to pick up on the land beings. And you do get a lot of fairy connections with families where, you know, the being looks after the great grandchildren in exactly the same way it looks after you because it thinks it's the same person. And when you start to, the way to understand this is, is to look at nature because anything to do with fairies and land beings, things like that, you just actually look at the physical nature and it will tell you a lot about the inner nature. And you look at the relationship, for example, between trees and their roots interconnecting and the fungus that grows and carries messages back and forth. And so a forest is like a hive being. It's a series of generations that we see as one forest. We see it as one thing. It's, all, it's actually all the same tree but we can see them as individual trees where it's actually all from the same tree and it is all the same tree. Uh, it's a hive. So things like that, you know, straight away, just look at the nature, look at the landscape around the village, around the family. What grows there? How does it grow? How does it regenerate each year? How does it interconnect with the other plants? That will tell you about the certain type of being that is connecting with that clan or that village. And a lot will tell you about what offerings work and what don't will tell you again, what type of land being, what does it need? How is it working? And that's very much like the magical version of, of learning to become emotionally integrated with the nature around you, which is something that I'm really trying to push on people is to really integrate yourself with the nature around you, even if it's just the grass coming up through the cracks in, in the, the pavements. Because you build a relationship with nature that way. If you build that relationship, you'll look after it. And we sorely need to learn how to look after our planet, our nature. And you do that not by running around the world on it. This, this cracks me up. People going around the world doing environmental lectures and workshops and this, that and the other while flying in aeroplanes and stuff. It's like, stay the fuck home and look after the land in your own little area and then get online and tell people how you're doing it. You, you really don't need to go on holiday in all these different places to do that. And it's something you can actually start for yourself. It always has to start somewhere. These sort of relationships with clans and villages didn't just drop out the sky. They started with one person noticing that there was a being there and that they were living alongside beings and that they needed to learn to live decently as decent neighbours. Can I help you? Do you need anything? Well, yeah, actually, I could do with this. Oh, fine. I'll, I'll get that for you. And in return, the being says, well, you know, there's some danger coming. You might want to avoid that. That's the beginning of a relationship that can last for generations. So, and it's something you can do. You don't need loads of magical training to do that. You just need to pay attention and be a decent human being. We have just a one last question on this area for you. A listener question from Anonymous who's saying, you've mentioned before that there's a difference between deity and divinity and that the Abrahamic religions deify divinity. 
you also mentioned that Jesus is a deity, not divinity. There is academic work suggesting that the names Yahweh and Allah used to refer to older pagan deities before they're referred to monotheistic divinity. When Jews, Christians, and Muslims pray and those names are used in those prayers, are those prayers, quote unquote, going to the deities, Yahweh, Jesus, Allah, or are they going to divinity, despite divinity being referred to by the names used for other deities in those religions? Well, when I made that comment, I I really didn't qualify it properly, which I do have a bad habit of doing, of making a lot of assumptions. And that's led to a lot of misunderstanding in this case, of, of what I was trying to get across. That's, that's my bad there. When I made the comment, I was going from a magical perspective and not a religious one. That does diverge a little. And this question is a religious question, really. So there's no direct magical answer to it. However, looking at this a little from a magical perspective might help you answer the question yourself. First, you have to separate out the tangle of mythos and dogma in religions that that define how we think and use vocabulary in terms of religion, which we've already talked about. And then also move the academic analysis to one side as well. Historical academic analysis is vital and it's fascinating and gives us a, a really deep insight into the evolution of religions and cultures and humanity and how dogma and mythos form from remnants of previous religions. But from a magical perspective in terms of this particular question, it's not actually that useful. Uh, You need to step out of both and and look at the vocabulary that we're using and what meaning we take from it. You know, words like divinity and deity are just words if there's no magical understanding behind that. And confusion can very quickly occur. And people also ascribe different meanings to those titles. For me, divinity is the conscious power that flows through the planet and through everything on it. It's not male or female. It has no human shape. It's beyond our understanding, but not our ability to pick up on, be aware of and connect with. And we see fragments of that in some of the polytheistic religions where there's an overarching deity who is the unknowable one which is what I term divinity to be, the unknowable. We know it's there. We know it's something. It's a consciousness. It's intelligent. It flows through everything. But I have no fucking idea what it is. To me, that's, that's divinity because it's in everything. Whereas deity to me, from a magical perspective, are vessels that the unknowable power can flow into and fill like a substation and a translator it becomes a translator for a particular expression of that unknowable power. You know, hence a lot of the deities in Egyptian, Sumerian, Babylonian, Hindu, early Greek, not the later classical, but early Greek, were aspects of the forces of nature. And it brings the power into a shape and focus that we can understand and interact with. And what monotheism did was take away to an extent, a lot of those vessels and substations. Christianity sort of took away all the previous ones and brought in new ones like, you know, oh, here's a human and we're going to call him a god and here's here's a lot of saints and you're going to pray to them and here's some angels and you're going to pray to them. And in Islam, they saw this problem with Christianity and more or less turn around and say, actually, you've got it wrong. Try this. And the, the way that Islam approached it was the 99 names of God and that each name is a specific power and quality. So if someone is very sick, where a pagan would pray to a certain deity and do certain things to trigger that deity and, and magically you would work on that person, a person in Islam would use that name, that healing name of God, repeated and within prayer. So again, it's like a substation translator. It's taking that unknowable, undefinable power and focusing it in to one thing so that it can be communicated and it can be experienced. Deities, for the most part, are the product of humanity attempting to interact with the vast, unknowable, intelligent consciousness that flows through everything, we try magically to give it boundary and limitation to that consciousness. 
and power by forming a vessel and deity that steps the power down and brings it the consciousness into focus. And it gives us a face we can talk to and interact to, but it needs to be plugged into something and you need to know where it is you're talking to. And the vessel needs to be formed in a way that will only allow that level of power to come through. When I was looking at that question, I was trying to think of a, a good analogy because some of this can get so cerebral that it just gets confusing and you go around in circles. Here's an analogy that might help. Imagine divinity is a massive river that's very powerful, very swollen, very deep, right up to the edges and extremely fast moving. You can't cross it. It's too dangerous to put a boat into it. It's moving so powerfully and so fast, you can't even put your hand in to get a drink of water in case you get pulled in and swept away. There's no calm shore. It's powerful right up to its edges. Humans come along and see they can do nothing with the river, but they need the river to survive. And they could achieve useful things if they could harness it. So they start to engineer the river. They build canals that divert some of the water across the land to feed the land for agriculture and provide safe water. In another part of the river, they dam parts of the river and, and flood it so that they can store water. They can make it accessible for washing, for toilets, things like that. They can use the power of the river to drive water wheels for power and grinding. They build a parallel canal to the river so they can travel down it on boats. They subdivide the power of the river into aspects so they can be worked with and interacted with. These subdivisions are how deities work. It needs human interaction and engineering, which is magic, to channel certain aspects of power to work in certain ways. But the core element, the river, is still divinity. The water that's flowing through the canal, the water that's on the water wheel, that's all the same water. The subdivisions in magic, the deities, the names, it's still divinity. It's just, it's dammed, it's canaled, it's put into a water wheel so it can work. Now, going along with the same analogy and magic, with the canal, they can bring water to the village. However, the canal must be engineered properly for it to work, and it must also be linked up to the river for the water to actually flow down the canal. If you build a canal from a village near to the river, but you don't actually finish it and connect it to the river, it won't work. However, if there's a factory nearby that draws water from the river further up, dumps a load of toxic waste into that river, and then lets it flow randomly into a pool or onto the land, the village canal that's nearby can actually give flow to that toxic water, which then poisons the village. This is the parasitical element of deity structure where the deity formation and magical construct has not been done correctly or has been done randomly or in a very stupid way. It basically allows the toxic flow into the deity structure. So what you're drinking is not the water of divinity, it's the toxicity of parasites. These are, are natural beings that have no physical form. What they exist on is energy that comes from emotions, from events, from all sorts of human activity, uh, from illness, things like that. They feed off of it. And so they manage to manipulate your mind and your body to behave in a certain way so that they can carry on feeding. When a date is first formed, there's a process of formation. And those formations can be highly structured magically, or they can be more shamanic. But they all have core methods that engineer the deity form so that the river of divinity can flow through it. If the deity form isn't engineered or not linked up properly to the river, you've actually no idea what's flowing through that form. And that's become a particular problem in more recent magic, you know, sort of in the last 150 years or so, particularly. And also in modern religions, where they're constructed out of ideas and counterculture, and chaos theories, things like that, you don't know if you're getting a river, toxic waste, or a mix, or how parasited that vessel is. I mean, it can be a very good learning experience. 
you know, some of the chaos magicians that experimented with some of this stuff, for them, it was very bad in the short term. They, they did themselves a lot of damage, some of them. But they also achieved some amazing things. And we've learned a lot from them doing that. It can be a very interesting, very powerful, but also very dangerous thing. It is all about understanding and vocabulary. And when you're talking about prayers and where prayers are going, that's a religious question. That's not a magical question. Josephine, as well, we have a listener question from Anonymous who's saying, in almost every religious tradition I'm aware of, including many indigenous and tribal ones, there's a taboo on women performing certain spiritual actions during her menstrual period. Some reasons I see for the taboo is because of ritual impurity or that the woman has a lot of spiritual power during that period. So if the woman touches a deity statue or a sacred object, then the woman will end up absorbing the power of those objects. Is there any merit, Anonymous is asking, to these reasons for these taboos? Or if not, why do you, Josephine, think this taboo exists in almost every tradition, including many tribal traditions? Well, I don't know about every tribal tradition, and that's not my field of study in, in the you know, learning of all these different cultures. All I can go on is from my own experience as a woman. With things like taboos, it's understanding them from a, an inner and outer perspective. And it's often tied in with the local religions, also the local powers, local beings. And then you get the old story, no matter humans are the same the world over, whether they're in a tribe, in a city, whatever, is you get cultural, social, personal and political agendas start mixing in. You get you know the dogmas that start being created from subdivision and you know OCD ways of approaching stuff. So some of that you have to take with a pinch of salt, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's often clues behind a lot of these things as to why. And sometimes they're no longer relevant and sometimes they are. I know for me, when I was premenstrual, I would fill with power. I really would fill with power. And a lot of women would feel very tired and their tide would go out, but Mine would start to build from ovulation, you know, and for 10 to 14 days, it would just build and build and build and it would become unstable and it would become volatile. And I would become fucking dangerous two, three days before a period. You know, if you, you talk to me the wrong way at the wrong time about the wrong thing, you would regret it because I would just tear your throat out. It took me through my 20s and 30s to learn how to manage that magically and how to work with people magically during that time without blowing people up or, or rampaging in rage. I did use it once magically in, in a very stupid way, but it was one of those disasters that teaches you great things in the long term, but was a disaster in the short term. I'd been working with Carly for a while, for a long while. And, and Carly was part of my teenage years. She, she was around both in the culture that I lived in and, and she, was, she was just there. And it, it was Durga and Carly were always there. And so in my 30s, I had this really bright idea of bringing Carly through into a vessel. I was teaching myself vessel construction. I thought it was a really good idea, and I thought it'd be a really good idea to do that when I was on a period and blah, 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 blah. And to cut a very long story short, I, I did manage to achieve it with a great amount of power to the point where the vessel had to be destroyed and, and put in a river, where it also, the, the actual construct process of bringing that power through of Carly while I, I was on the cusp of a period gave me scarlet fever. I'd had a little bit of a sore throat for a couple of days and the inner and outer burden of doing that over a three-day period basically crushed my immune system and the little sore throat turned into scarlet fever. And I was in a terrible mess for a long time. And it made me very wary for a while. But then when I was ready, I picked up the pieces and then started to analyze all the steps, all the processes, because I've journaled it and started to realize how power works, how vessels work, how blood works, how periods work, that sort of thing. But it is definitely a time of power rising, but it is very different from woman to woman. I think you can understand some of the taboos 
if you, once you get over the anger that I used to feel of, you know, women had to be separated when they were on a period. It's like, who the fuck do you think you are telling me I have to go sit over there because I'm a period? Fuck you. And, you know, getting over that and not accepting it, but sitting down and looking at it rationally from a magical perspective, I could start to see where the reasoning came from. Didn't mean I agreed with it. And a lot of the time when the, the cultures that I did look at in, in relation to this, it was about suppressing that power in women because women can become very dangerous. It's why a lot of women get very depressed when they're very close to a period, not only because you've got the biology going on, and we all know about the biology and neurotransmitters and all of that, but for, there's also an inner side to your biology. And the inner side of that is if you suppress someone's power for long enough, they will become powerless. They will become depressed. They will self-limit their own power and destabilize. And a lot of these taboos, that was one of the effects that it had and has, is that it destabilizes that power of self. It destabilizes the ability to tap into that power and understand it and learn to work with it and to learn to work with it in a very productive way that would actually be good for the tribe. It's a fear-filled, misogynistic approach of it must be shut down, they're unclean, they must be put away. If you've got someone who can draw or fill a deity power while on a period, you've got the perfect constructor of vessels there. You know, our women's bodies are built for making humans, for making vessels. That's what we do. And using the menstrual power, and for some people it peaks for a few days before the period until the first blood. For some, it peaks until the second day of bleeding. For some, the power bottoms out straight away. People, women learning their own power by observing again, journaling, observing your own period from the moment of ovulation until the end of a period is observing magically and observing power, mood, energy levels, all of that sort of thing. You'll find out how your own personal power works. And from that, as a magician, you can then learn to work with that peak of power and you're going to blow yourself up a couple of times like I did. But you will learn then where your skill set is. And with the understanding that women are natural vessel builders, when you then, as a historian, start to look back into you know, early religions, you will actually find that some of the earliest vessel makers in those religions were women, because that's what we do. We give birth to things. Men can't do that. Men do other things. They're not lesser beings. Men do things too. And they're very good at structuring the long-term pattern for that vessel to flow through and together. And this is regardless of sexuality. It's about power. You know, working together, you can bring all sorts through. And if you tend to be someone who's a bit of both, as in, like me, I'm physically a woman. I'm very androgynous. You know, biologically, I was a high testosterone female. I was very boyish, but there wasn't the culture for that when I was growing up and, and certainly not in the family and local community. You were expected to be pink and pretty and get married and have lots of children and do as you're told. And I was the exact opposite. I was very masculine in a lot of ways and still am. I, I think like a man. When I was in my teens, I had this bright idea I was going to join the military. Not because I, I liked the military, but because I thought the uniforms were cool and, you know, I'd actually learn skills and, and, you know, I wanted to be in sort of radar control, that sort of thing. It's all very glamorous and I wanted to do that. So you'd go down to the local office and get tested and they do IQ tests on you and, and Eisnex tests and things like that. Not only tested your IQ, they would also indicate your gender and your gender thinking. And my gender thinking tests out as a man. And, you know, that's, that's meant for a, a, an interesting and difficult life at times. But it does bring an element in with the magic that, you know, I have the body of a woman, 
that can give birth to things. Well, until they ripped out my womb, but I can give I could give birth to things. But I also thought like a man, so I could birth vessels and construct long term magical patterns, which is how Quarrier was born. And I think there's a lot of this that we're just starting to learn that you know there is polarization and polarity is basically bullshit. That there's so many flows in between, and there's so many jobs that you can do magically with all these different levels of power and hormones and gender and things like that. Is there's all sorts of practical uses in magic that that things can be useful. So people who who are very androgynous are basically got the best of both worlds because you can bring things through and then you can pattern them. But yeah, I was so glad actually when I had a hysterectomy and I no longer bled because it literally sucks the life out of you and your power is constantly up, down, up, down. There's no consistency. And I certainly wouldn't have been able to do quarrier with a uterus and menstruating. I, I wouldn't have been able, no, stable enough to do that with the power. It was timed in perfectly and that fate gave me an illness and got me to the point where that organ needed to be removed. And then I needed to heal from all of that surgery and treatments and everything. And then I was ready to go. So it was great. When you think about the amazing long-term patterning of Quaria and just, I, I can't even begin to imagine how much of a just massive effort that was, but then because of that long-term patterning, how many people benefited from that you know it's just amazing to think about yeah my trouble gets out all over the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll have everyone swearing you know fuck will become the sacred mantra in 300 years time <laughs> <laughs> if i achieve that i know i've achieved something <laughs> the great holy fuck <laughs> I wonder if you and, and Jake Stratton Kent are still in that competition as to who can who can say it more, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, because it's you know in America when I lived in America, it's it's quite shocking. You know, bad language is is really shocking and sort of a sign that you're a degenerate or a bad person or something like that. It's like, dude, you not you lot need to go live in Northern Ireland for a while or even Southern Ireland. It's like you know every sentence from the age of about four. It's just lots of cursing and swearing. It's just part of the culture. And it's actually really hard to switch from that to then going living in America where you can't swear. I was doing some teacher training and I had to do three months in a high school. I didn't speak because I was terrified what was going to come out my mouth. It literally is just culture. That, it that's is. How it is. And it's not considered bad or, or degenerate or anything like that. It's just emphasizing. It comes from a nation of storytellers. You know, Ireland is a nation of storytellers, of mythos, uh, where the land is soaked with stories. And stories need emphasis and they need fun and humor and terror and lots of swear words. Because it wakens the attention and, you know, it emphasizes a point. And so, yes, you know, Quarrier achieves in 300 years that there is a dogma that's the holy sacred mantra of I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Then I've achieved something. As an aside, I remember. Well, how are you going to slide that one into the next <laughs> to the next question? You know, on, let's see how you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking. Yeah, right, you can do it. I was thinking when I was in Ireland, it's not F U C K, it's it's F E C K. It's fact, 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 fact and this and fact and that. We're gonna fact yep. with the fact and the fact. That's what yep. it was. Yep, that's right. <laughs> you know, I grew up in Yorkshire, and it's West Yorkshire accent is Norwegian and Danish, and it's very uh, it's very down and very uh sound. So you get folk <laughs> rather than. Fuck. <laughs> so, you know that mother, you know <laughs> that is so someone needs to do a montage of the different ways to pronounce it in yeah. you know yeah. english speaking areas with america exactly we we have no problem with hollywood showing incredibly violent you know bloody movies but anything sexual or anything with uh, swear words and it's it's all of a sudden a taboo because i think america is 
still in this kind of post-Protestant, strangely semi like religious culture that Europe has completely, in many ways, moved completely away from. So I think you still have some residue of this kind of post-Pilgrim Protestant sensitivity to it in a way. It, it is strange. Um, are you kidding me? My God, the culture shock for the first two years of living in the States is like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? It, it was like, you know, moving into sort of, you know, severe Presbyterian 19th century, like, good Lord. And yet, yeah, yeah, they're fine with showing, you know, women being abused and, you know, they're fine with shoot ups and, you know, gore and death. And they think it's OK that people have guns and go shoot loads of kids. And say, oh, that's OK. But you say, fuck, my God, we're going to put you in prison. It's like, whoa. <laughs> but yet when you live it in is, it, it you're is. watching it, it's normal. It's all about what's normal to you. It is. And there are so many hangups that I think Americans have. Although I will say in America's defense, I will say I I remember when I was young and I said, oh, I, I've got a little bloody cut on my on my finger. And someone's someone who is British says, you can't say bloody. And I'm thinking, why can't I say bloody? Like, it's just bloody. But apparently if you say bloody, that's worse than fuck. Oh, no, no, no. That's South South England. The English are incredibly fucking uptight. Don't forget. Ah. The Irish and the English are two completely different people. Never the twin shall meet almost to a point, especially in Southern England. You know, once the North of England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Cornwall, those are where the same people live. And poor bastards that have to live in the rest of the country are surrounded by similar uptight Protestant culture of all of Europe, probably is England, particularly Southern England, very, very uptight. And it's getting better. It's getting much better. But yeah, bloody hell and things like that. But I mean, you get a three-year-old would say that and no one would blink an eyelid. But there again, it's also a, a form of snobbery. If, well, I'm terribly English and I don't swear and I'm a lady <laughs> and ladies don't behave like that. And it's, it's all class. The class system in this country is disgusting. And anyone who swears straight away, you're lower class. Wow. So I make a point of, you know, when I'm around some an English person like that, it's like a reflex action. I will swear more. And I don't really do it consciously. It just happens. And then I realize it's happening. So I try and stop it, but it happens even more. Every fucking, fucking word that fucking comes out my fucking mouth is a fucking swear word because that fucking bitch over there has been so fucking uptight. I just want to rub a fucking face in it. So <laughs> it was just like, no, no. My brain is going, no, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> my mouth is going, fuck you. I'll do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, it's a type. You know, I've got a sister. There's seven of us, and I've got one of my sisters is like that. She's so up her own ass. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Just, you know, she's so terribly, terribly. And it's like, who the fuck do you think you are and where the fuck did you grow up? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so a couple things to that point. Number one, in addition to leaving all of this in, because I think it's amazing. <laughs> I, I also must say, I do uh, your, yourself, and I, I have a few other friends in, in the UK, and Obviously, America has so many challenges with race and class and things like that. But when I hear someone talk about the British class system, that seems so like I had never heard of like even my friend, she was telling me when when there are social gatherings, if you're not of the same class as someone in a social gathering, there is an immediate standoffishness and immediate. Well, why are you here? It just seems so different. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was one of the joys of being in America is you don't have that. And it's very much a merit based social structure in America. Here, it's breeding. What genetic lines do you come from? What do your parents do? What do you do? Where do you come from? What town is it? Each, you know, there's working class, middle class and aristocracy. And then within those, there's all subdivisions. And then right at the bottom is, oh, you know, you're Welsh, or oh, you're Irish, or oh, you're a Scot. Well, that's even below the lowest of the low, uh, especially when I was a kid, when I was growing up. 
if you were Irish, you were less than human, literally treated less than human. Pubs where dogs are not allowed in, the Irish weren't out allowed in either. You know, you had to sit outside and get someone to come bring something out for you. Really disgusting. Wow. And there's still elements of that to this day, of that level of discrimination. Going on this, there was um, somebody made a comment on one of my YouTube videos. I think it was a tarot video. It was an interesting discussion. Someone was pulling me up on discrimination because I discriminated against men because I said that men couldn't find things like socks in the cupboard and salt and keys and things like that, which is actually a biological thing, is that male brains work in slightly different ways and perceive things in slightly different ways. But aside from that, you know, one of the things I wanted to do with Quarry is stamp down discrimination when I see it and enable anyone who wants to do magical training, if they are willing to work at it and they are capable and stable enough to do it, there should be no barrier because there are quite a lot of barriers in magical training in general of race, gender, that sort of thing. I was basically getting pulled out as being the privileged white woman. And, you know, yes, I'm white. And that brings a lot of privilege with it, which, which I really get. I really do. That doesn't stop me wanting to fight discrimination. And in America, you know, white women are extremely privileged in terms of race and discrimination. Once you're getting into Europe and other countries, though, it's not the same. In, in America, it's very polarized as the discrimination. It's very much towards the black African-American community, Mexican community. You know, if, if it's visual, your skin will give you away. Whereas in, in other countries, it's not the same. And a lot of people don't realize, for example, the discrimination historically. And this is a very touchy subject because even today it's still an issue. So I have to tread very carefully with this between the Irish and the English. You know, that's gone on for 800 years. It's still ongoing. Like in my lifetime, Indigenous Irish in Northern Ireland, which are the Catholic community, didn't have the same voting rights. They didn't have property rights. They, they, there was a lot of rights that they didn't have. They were discriminated against horrifically. And then they started fighting back. And, and that's, you know, you get the troubles, which is what it was called, which was basically, you know, fighting back from state-sanctioned discrimination. People were not being able to get a job because they're Irish, not being able to get housing because they're Irish not being able to go into a pub, sit down and have a drink because they're Irish. They have an accent. That's why, you know, my father and his family moved to England so that we could get an education and grow up in a way that wasn't like what he grew up with. And, you know, it's only really changed in the last 30 years when there was the bombing campaigns on the mainland in England. You know, you had to be very careful. You couldn't put a bag down anywhere. And if you walked into any building, and there was a box or a bag on the floor and not a person stood right at the side of it, you turned around and walked out of the building because it could be a bomb. And we grew up with that. And in Northern Ireland, the kids grew up with a lot worse than that. And that went along with, that's an IRA bombing. And so IRA means Irish, you're Irish. Uh, that means Irish accent. So in England, every time there was a bombing campaign, anyone with an Irish accent that was either not liked, considered to be looking suspicious, acting suspicious, actually like stood on a street corner just having a cigarette looking around. That's suspicious. They had an Irish accent. They said hello in an Irish accent. And they actually put it out on the news. If there's any Irish people in that area, if you saw an Irish person in that vicinity, near that bombing, call the police. Now, you imagine just the discrimination of that. And what that then led to was Irish people rounded up, proven guilty, even though they hadn't done anything. There was no evidence. And they go to prison for years. And it took years for them, you know, for evidence to actually come to light that they had nothing to do with it. They were just random people. So growing up with that, um, my dad was involved with all of that politically. So I saw that and spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland as a kid. I know discrimination when I see it. And I grew up in a time and an area where, you know, being gay would either get you knifed, beaten up or put in prison. 
it was against the law. You know, all of these things I grew up with. So, yeah, I will fight discrimination whenever I see it. And just because I'm white and I'm female, if somebody doesn't like that, they can fuck off. I do get that I have a privilege. I can walk around in America and be as privileged as possible. But I've walked around in other places and lived in other places where that was not a privilege, where it was actually the reverse. So even though it's a fragment of understanding of what other people have struggled through, when you have that fragment of understanding, use it to the best of your ability to stop and stamp that out anywhere in the world, in whatever area you're working with. And I have absolutely no idea how the fuck we got to that. Somehow we went around the houses. No, no. And got there. That is amazing, Josephine. And I can't remember if you and I were discussing this off the air after a podcast or not, but I remember being in Derry and, and Belfast in 2006 and, and just in Derry in, in particular, seeing the Catholic neighborhoods painted, the, the curbs were painted with the colors of the Irish flag and then or the flag of Ireland. And then you had the uh, Protestant neighborhoods, you know, painted in orange or painted in the British colors. I remember just the feeling as an American, just going in to one neighborhood and there's a mural on the wall, you know, giant mural outside, you know, this is, you know, Johnny McFlynn hero and person who, you know, helped defend us and our people, et cetera. And then you get in a taxi and you go to the, the other neighborhood. And I can't remember which one was Catholic or Protestant. It's another mural with the same guy. You know, this is the same guy who's horrible and was a terrorist and killed, you know, seven people on this date in 19 something, something. And just seeing that within such a close distance really is a huge eye opener just for the amount of history and complexity and brutality yeah. and everything. Oh yeah. And, and very insular, very insular looking. I mean, it, it's changed with the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, it's not stopped everything, but it's made life easier and for the younger generation, and they're actually, they're the future. The younger generation are really opening out, maturing on all sides and coming together. And it's still difficult, but it's great to see. What I really like about the young generation is they don't take any shit. They want a decent life. And they're not going to replay these old tribal games that have gone on for hundreds of years. They're not, they're not going to play that. They want a future and they're fighting, you know, they're going to fight, not physically, they, they're going to work towards it. But yeah, in Derry, it is, it's very close. If I can remember being in Derry, it must have been, I don't know, 1970, 1971, something like that with my dad. And uh, we'd already caused a bit of a furore because we had one of my dad's friends with me, his best friend who was Sikh, who had a turban on. And the people in Derry had never seen anything like it. They were all staring like, what the fuck is that? And it was the Apprentice Boys March. And so we stood on the curb watching this march. And my dad had a really tight hold on me because, you know, I was only a kid. There was an IUC officer stood next to my dad. And my dad turned around to me and said, you know, is there going to be any trouble because, you know, my little girl's here? And he said, oh, no, no, no trouble. There's no Catholics here. And I went to open my mouth to say, oh, I'm a Catholic. And my dad just put his hand straight over my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> grabbed me, spun me around and just whooped me off quietly. Like, shut the fuck up. Wow. Get over there. Yeah. Oh. Like, oh, I mean, you know, but it's normalized, you know, just driving around there, coming to roadblocks, people with balaclavas covering their faces and, you know, fucking machine guns pointed at you. It's just like, you know, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going down the road. Oh, okay then. <laughs> you know, it's, it's bizarre. It's just totally surreal. That's how it is. But, you know, people in different, they don't see that. People in America, that you know, unless they're actually from an Irish family, they have no idea any of this stuff goes on. I remember seeing tanks in the street in Belfast walking oh, yeah. around. Just tanks and armed, this was 2006, but tanks and armed guards. And I remember when you wanted to go into a pub in Belfast in 2006, that a lot of the pubs had giant chain gates that you had to open and there were security cameras everywhere. I mean, it was just yeah. like walking into a different world. Yeah. Yeah. It was chaos. It was terrible, especially, you know, the late sixties to the mid seventies that, you know, that's when it all really kicked off. But, you know, people on all sides in Northern Ireland have lived in a horrifying way for decades. 
And this is what pisses me off with Brexit because it's bringing that back again. It's inadvertently kicking all of that off because of the stupid greed of, of a group of fucking aristocratic tits that are in Westminster at the moment. Just the damage they're doing, they just don't get it. Well, they do get it, they just don't care. Josephine, t- actually, to that point, I wish I was clever enough to come up with an amazing transition <laughs> from where we were to our last two listener questions. But I cannot do that uh, because I am I am not that clever. However, I think listeners will really appreciate uh, just your perspective and talking about the history. I really do appreciate that and, and you taking the time to share about that. We do have uh, a few more listener questions. We have a listener question for you, Josephine, from... Naomi C. Taranis, who is asking, Josephine, what is your process for creating your Oracle deck? I've been called recently, Naomi says, to create one of my own decks, and I'm getting somewhat hung up in the process of taking it from inspiration to card. I'd love to hear how you, Josephine, made your deck a reality. Well, with something like an Oracle deck, which... A tarot deck is easy because the, the template is already there. You've got, you know, your 22 trumps and you've got your minor cards and blah. When you're doing a non-tarot deck, the, there isn't a boundary for that. But the two different approaches, is, and they're both valid, it all depends on why you're doing it and what it's going to be used for. One is the creative approach, artistic approach, which is a balance of archetype, psychology, mythos, inspiration, blah. And... You know, if you're going to do a deck that way, you have to be very disciplined. Well, in both ways, you have to be very disciplined. But the basic key to that is show up for work every day, even when you're, you don't feel like it and you're not inspired. It is, it, that's how I wrote Quarry in such a short time, is you show up for work every morning, even if you're not inspired and you don't feel like it and you feel like shit. You have a job to do and you have to do, you know, so many thousands of words in one day. You have to do one painting in so many days. You show up and you paint it and you carry on every day until you finish that painting. And that's it. That's the first approach. The second approach is the magical approach. And and that's if the deck is to be used magically. That's a lot more complicated because it needs a magical pattern to work through, which means that you need to understand magic enough to either pick up on or construct a coherent magical pattern that's watertight and that's balanced and that makes sense then you have to look at once you've got that pattern what beings need to be expressed and which ones don't because there's so many different types of beings places tools powers people you have to narrow down the vocabulary as to what actually needs to be in it and so a lot of that's paperwork of writing down a family tree of certain realms. Well, who needs to be there? Who doesn't? Is there a card that can be used for three or four different meanings? Good. Then you only need that one. You don't need all three. And then the actual painting process is because I'm currently working on a similar sort of project at the moment. And before you're painting, you might map out an idea in your head or sketch out, you know, I want to do this, 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 and this for this particular card. You get to paint it and, you know, you're doing it as a contacted painting. Therefore, the gates are open. You're working in vision at the same time that you're painting. And, you know, your brain is going, yes, well, we're going to do this, this and this. And the inner flow is going, yeah, that's nice. But no, actually, we're going to do that. So it's magical technique. It really does depend on why you're doing it and where it's going to go, who's going to use it. Well, I think that's incredibly valuable advice because, you know, you are one of the best people to ask. And the last listener question we have for you, Josephine, is from Echo. And Echo is saying a big hello and thank you to Josephine for her work, which has impacted my own life in countless ways for the better. I know I'm not alone in my admiration and gratitude as the last year has tossed me about. I've learned to lean in to the tidal thrashings a bit. Some of these are partially my own fault. My magical mistakes are hilariously stupid in hindsight. However, Echo says, I always learn more than I bargain for. I'm wondering if Josephine has any anecdotes from her years past of magical mistakes that turned into invaluable learning experiences that she'd be willing to share as laughter is powerful magic in itself. 
Oh, God, my whole life is one set of magical mistakes turning into <laughs> valuable experiences, a lot of which I've actually written into some of the books, you know, because it's when you write books, especially on stuff like magic, you know, you've got to write in how much of an idiot you are. You know, when I, I read some, this is why I stopped reading magical books. You read some and, and they're so fucking pompous and full of themselves and, and up their own asses that they were actually perfect from day one. It's like, no, the fuck you weren't. You know, is show your process and show your idiocy because that's how you learn and that's how other people then get confidence to, to work is, you know, knowing that everyone makes mistakes and everyone starts somewhere. There was one particular situation that actually turned into a magical April Fool's joke. This happened a while ago, a long while ago. I propped my magical sword up by the fire, which is where it lived at the time. And I had at the side of the fire a dragon statue. And at the time, I had a lot of incoming fire attacks from a talented but very vengeful, unstable magician. And so what I did was worked with an underworld being. I went into the underworld, talked to this being, and it was like a dragon-type being. The magic, fire magic, that's, that's what it really liked. And it had taken me a lot of working to actually find this being. And I convinced it to come up to the surface with me and live in a vessel um, where it could eat as much fire magic as it wanted, and which was great for me and it was great for it. So I got a statue, I exercised it, stripped the statue, made it into a vessel, bridged the being into it, good to go. Suddenly, all the fine magic stopped. That was great. Then one day, this magician who was, he was a natural magician, but nuts, basically, very unstable. He was in my front room, and I was in the kitchen making a cup of coffee, and he'd, he'd been pestering me about the sword, and he kept asking me really stupid questions and kept asking and kept asking. I said, look, just pick it up and get a feel for it. You know, just be careful, but just pick it up and just get the sense of it. So I was assuming that the person had enough brains that they'd just pick up the sword and feel the energy of it, register that feeling, and then carefully put it back down again. No. He felt the power in it, which triggered his ego, which triggered his mental instability, and he started to swing the sword around, feeling terribly powerful, and beheaded the fire dragon statue, which immediately released oh. the being because it was a magical sword. It released the being into the room. And this is an underworld destructive being that feeds on fire and then gives back other stuff. Then I walked into the room with the coffees to find him there with a the sword in his hand, the destroyed dragon on the floor and, and this haze in the room, which is very rare to see, but that's when the power of a being is so strong. It's inner power. You can see it with your outer eyes or if you've got sight, I can. And it was like a mist in the room. It's like, what the fuck have you done? So, oh, God, so I had to gather up the being, get him down into the abyss, into his cave, apologise profusely. That being never agreed to work with me again after that, which was a very harsh lesson. But I couldn't have it wandering around. And uh, anyway, the joke came, as in cleaned up all the mess and everything. It also, by the way, destroyed my magical sword because it injured a being out of no necessity, out of ego which impacted the sword and, and knocked it out of balance, so I had to destroy it. So anyway, while all this is going on, in my hallway the day after, I had a, a check on a, a narrow shelf in the hallway, which was waiting to go to the bank. What I did was light an incense stick just to clear the hall out a little bit, just to make it smell nice. I'd put the actual real frankincense going in the room, in the main room, to clear it from all of this. And I had to go out. So I went out and the incense stick was, you know, it was on a, in a good holder, good solid holder and everything. And I just forgot it was there. And when I got back, I noticed that there were scorch marks up the wall near the stick. It must have touched the wall. But you know how incense sticks can sometimes fragment with bits still alight? And bits had fallen onto the check, set the check on fire and scorched it, except for the date and the amount and the date on the check was 1st of April. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those, uh, did you get that? That could have cost you a lot out of your own stupidity. And the stupidity was 
if you have a being like that in a vessel in your house that's that dangerous, do not let other people in your house. If you have to, do not leave them unattended in that room. Do not have your magical sword where someone can grab it. When you've dealt with a fire being, don't walk out of the house with a stick that's basically on fire, left unattended. Lots of different lessons in there for me. Lots and lots of different ones. It left its calling card as a, like, fuck you on the way out. <laughs> but it was the April Fool's. And in the end, because I needed a replacement check. And they didn't believe me. So I sent the check in of what was left of it, which was basically some crumbs of ashes and the little part that just said, you know, 1st of April and the, and the year and the amount. And they actually called me up and they said, if I hadn't seen this, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> it was just, it was great. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So this really highlights the fact that, you know, someone who is at your level, someone who's experienced so much and has written so much about this, that this experience comes from surfing the waves of chaos and entropy and learning from things and that direct experience that's so important for people. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't, you, magic, you can't develop in magic unless you're developing from actual experience. Not where you can read every magical book out there in the universe. You can listen to every lecture. You can get yourself nice, fancy outfits and the tools. You can have a magical room and put a magical floor. Down, all of that stuff. All of that is completely irrelevant. Experience is where it's at. That's your teacher. Direct experience. Josephine, just as we wrap up here, is there anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with? Anything that you can share with us about perhaps some future projects, things coming down down the line that we should keep our ear to the ground on? Anything you'd like to share? The one thing I will say is I've been doing, I'm working on a series of audio and visual, I call it video, but you don't see my face in it. It's readings. I'm going through different tarot readings, layouts, advice for students type of thing because tarot seems to be where everyone has a problem. I'm doing them sort of one a month and I'm putting them in the quarry porch, which is the discussion group so that they can talk about it if they need to. And then, you know, once they've done their bit, I'm putting it out on the website for general viewing. The first one's up, the second one's been recorded and that once it's edited, that will go up. I intend to carry on doing that. I'm trying to get as many resources as I can out for people it's just time because, you know, I still have to earn a living and run around like a headless chicken, trying to just to help people learn and get it out there for free and stick it on the website. So every so often, if people revisit, especially with the free books page and this free video page and whatever, you can figure it all out. You're all grown up. Author, occultist, magical teacher, tarot expert, and just overall amazing person, Josephine McCarthy. Josephine, thank you so much for taking the time and stopping on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you so, so much to Josephine McCarthy for sharing her wisdom. And thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon for your questions and your insights. Again and again, I don't know about you, but Josephine's words, her wisdom, ring throughout my mind at different times of the day when she urges us to pay attention, know the tides, know ourselves, to jump right into magical practice without the hesitation of, am I doing it to perfection? Jumping in with all of our scars, our triumphs, our ways to improve, our talents, our aspirations, all of it. As Josephine says, pay attention. And that is something I know for myself, I always need to do more of. And again, a huge thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon. Your questions were so good. And as always, they take the conversation in new and interesting directions. And if you would like to support the Glitch Bottle podcast with exclusive perks, I mean, if you actually enjoy being bombarded with nerdiness and specific elements of ritual magic and submitting questions for guests, please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. As always, you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding us all to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. <laughs>